So we will, for those who are who have just joined us, um, we are opening the meeting. I'm calling the meeting to order uh, of the Lawyer Assistance Program Oversight Committee. Um, Jennifer, please call the roll. Heather Benton. Here. Jim Hiding. Here. Tracy Lesage. Here. Bill Spiegel. Martin Williams. Here. Elise Yenny. Here. We have five members and we have a quorum. I'm also here. I'm sorry, uh, Justin Delacruz. Here. We have six members and we have a quorum. Okay. Um, report of the chair. Um, we will be discussing today and planning for our next year. It's an exciting time. Um, more is being asked of us, more input is being asked of us. So please bring your best ideas. Um, we'll move to item one, approval of the minutes. Can, I'm gonna apologize. Can we pause for oh. to see public comment? I know it's not on the agenda. <laughs> it's not on the printed agenda, so my apologies. Feels like we're a bit in twilight zone here. Uh, Jennifer, can you make the announcement regarding public comment and see if we're available? So I entered as a public person and I am now in. Great. So. Thank you, Lena, for confirming that. This meeting is being recorded. Before I do the roll call, we ask that anyone who plans on giving public comment to use the raise hand function to indicate that you'd like to do so. I'm not seeing any raised hands, so. I, okay, I just raised my hand. You uh, don't see me? No. I'm, I'm just. Sure. Oh, I'm now there. I see it. Okay. A little black box. Okay. Up. Okay, I'm going to lower my hand. I just wanted to make sure that this is working properly. Yeah, I can see that raised hand. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay. So we'll move to approval of the minutes. This is Jim Hiding. I'll move to approve the minutes. <laughs> Any discussion on item? If not, uh, we will vote. Jennifer, please call the roll. Heather Benton? Yes. Jim Heidi? Yes. Tracy Lesage? Approved. Bill Spiegel? Martin Williams? Yes. Elise Jenny? Yes. Okay, we have uh, Justin Delacruz? Uh, yes. We have six votes out of six. The minutes are so approved. We will move to item C1, LAP Outreach. Uh, is there an update on LAP Outreach? Yeah, we'll go ahead and uh, hopefully defer that to the business section of the meeting where there will be slides um, providing more information regarding the 2022 outreach um, for the full year and since our last meeting. So. Okay, so let's move to item two, uh, C2, Recent Developments. Okay. Uh, Randy, are you available again to give a high level sure. overview of 8.3? Uh, good morning, members of the committee. I'll be reporting on a recent development that transpired at the board's November 17th meeting. At that meeting, as part of the board chair staff report, the board directed the secretary to refer the consideration of ABA model rule of professional conduct 8.3 to the board standing committee on professional responsibility and conduct, which is uh, known by COPRAC. Uh, COPRAC is the committee that assists the board on rules of professional conduct, as well as drafts the state bars non-binding advisory ethics committee. Model rule 8.3 is entitled reporting misconduct. And it is the rule that is adopted uh, in one form or another by every jurisdiction in the United States, except for California, and it requires a lawyer who knows that another lawyer has committed a violation to report that uh, to an appropriate professional authority. The rule, however, does provide an exemption uh, and it does not require disclosure information protected by Rule 1.6, which is the duty of confidentiality, or information gained by a lawyer or judge while participating in an approved lawyer's assistance program. And that's the main reason we're calling this the attention of this body. Uh, because we know that the statutory protections that exist uh, for lawyers' protection, uh, lawyers' uh, assistance programs in California uh, are important and might not even be coextensive with um, 
the language that the ABA uses in its uh, wording of, of how that information is protected so that a lawyer would not have to be under the requirement to report. Um, the language of the statute actually prohibits disclosure of information. And it it's worded so that it would um, cover, I believe, uh, more than just information concerning actual participation. I think it would cover even inquiries to an assistance program. Uh, in that regard, it would be similar to the attorney-client privilege that doesn't just extend the information when you actually have entered into a relationship, but even information conveyed by prospective clients when they're seeking to hire a lawyer. So we will keep you apprised as COPRAC uh, looks at this rule. They've been asked to report back to the board at its May uh, meeting. Um, the process includes developing a draft, having the board authorize it for public comment, likely 60 days. That comment will be reviewed and uh, there's a revised version that makes material changes and that would be recirculated for public comment. But ultimately, if there is a rule recommended, it would be presented to the board for adoption. And if the board adopts it, it still would not become effective until it is submitted to the Supreme Court uh, for approval. If approved by the Supreme Court, uh, then the rule would be binding on all lawyers. Uh, the only additional development is that earlier this week, uh, Senator Umberg introduced a bill, Senate Bill 42, which would codify by its terms the requirement imposed by Model Rule 8.3 as a statutory provision, Section 6090.8. And we are looking uh, to work cooperatively with the legislature in developing a rule considering what would best uh, for California. And that's my report. Uh, one footnote is that the timeline uh, originally envisioned when the board made its referral to COPRAC, bringing it back in May, may be accelerated by the fact that uh, a bill has been introduced as legislative timelines move a lot quicker. I'm happy to take any questions. This is Jim Hiding. With all due caution that we might not have the pre-public invitation recorded or reported, I wanted to point out that uh, in attending the Commission on Lawyer Assistance Programs in Washington, D.C. this fall, this rule was discussed. Uh, and it, I pointed out that uh, in our very litigious, probably the highest uh, rate of litigation in the nation uh, arises in California, and the lawyers are very contentious at times, and especially in uh, Los Angeles and Orange counties. And this rule that requires or permits a lawyer to report on another lawyer as to honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness as a lawyer uh, seems to me to be very dangerous and uh, will, give, will give rise to a lot of reports that are unfounded and maybe uh, impactful to the reputations of others and uh, to the litigation itself. Um, and so I think that this has to be approached very carefully and uh, it's probably wrong uh, to me as a mandatory reporting requirement. So. And this is Justin Delacruz. I'd like to make a recommendation or suggestion and this, well, this is my own. This is not of the committee, to be clear. Um, but subdivision C to replace the word require with authorize. Those are both great uh, comments and observations. We'll be sure to relay that to, to COPRAC. Okay. So, oh, wow. um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Randy. So I wanted to give a very brief um, staff report regarding some of the other matters that the Board of Trustees approved at the November meeting. Um, so uh, officially, as of the November 2022 Board of Trustees meeting, the um, board, as well as uh, its sub-entities and committees, are now um, following Rosenberg's rules of order. It used to be that the um, board and the committees were following Robert's rules of order. And this shouldn't um, be something that significantly impacts this committee, but uh, the main changes are that the chair gets to be more involved in the uh, 
decision making process, including the ability to make a, a motion or second a motion, as well as to vote. Um, what will happen, as you have seen in voting on the minutes, is that the chair will be called last so as to not potentially sway the votes of any committee members. Um, but that will be how that works going forward. Um, they also made a change to um, promote the ability of individuals to give public comment and to allow more public participation in meetings. Uh, that includes uh, now clarifying that the public can sign up in advance to give public comment. Um, a, a form is posted as part of the agenda materials so that an individual can sign up to give public comment um, at the meeting, either remotely or if it's a hybrid meeting in person. Um, as well as the public is encouraged to submit written public comment and to do so at least 24 hours in advance of a meeting so that the materials can be provided to the committee um, in the in the evening, the, the, the day prior to that meeting um, or as soon as possible, basically. Um, so those are two kind of big changes. One other change related to public comment is that individuals are now um, uh, authorized to give at least two minutes of public comment. So there, um, it's, that's the requirement across any um, state bar committee or uh, sub entity of the Board of Trustees. And that likely impacts other committees more than this committee, frankly, because there, as we saw again today, there aren't often individuals who are here to make public comment, um, but that timing is something to consider. So it's two minutes or more. So if we only have one, it's at the chair's discretion based on the agenda um, and the amount of materials that we're hoping to cover in the time of the meeting, but it would have to be at least two minutes. Any questions? Say no. Okay. Yeah. All right, Jennifer, will you please bring that first set of slides up for lap? Sorry. So, lawyer assistance program. <laughs> Um, intro slide. Next slide, please. <laughs> it, yes, that one. Um, so the, this slide tells you who we work with and why we're here. Um, we work with law students, applicants, current attorneys, former attorneys, basically anyone soon to be or was or currently an attorney. Um, our goal is to enhance public protection and, of course, we are addressing issues of substance use and mental health problems and helping attorneys um, form a plan of recovery and maintain their recovery from any of those issues. Um, next slide, please. So this one is kind of refers to what Heather was talking about at one point with confidentiality. So. We always make sure at the beginning of presentations to make sure that everybody knows about the confidentiality of the program, um, which is that by the statute that created our program, no information that is received by the LAP can be disclosed as part of a civil proceeding, disciplinary or public records request. Um, there is mandating reporting requirements. Most of the staff that somebody would be dealing with are licensed clinicians. So if somebody's talking about hurting themselves, hurting other people, child abuse, elder abuse, those types of things that we're required to report, we would report to the appropriate authorities, but not to any um, other office in the state bar that would relate to discipline. Um, and then of course, if an attorney chooses or a participant chooses to waive confidentiality, we need to have a written release form signed in order for us to be able to share information um, about their compliance with offices of the state bar we might be reporting to, like the Office of Probation, the Office of Admission, if somebody is here for their um, moral character process, or state bar court, of course. So can you tell tell us what, the, in your middle part, the four part, four mandated reporting by healthcare professional, how does that relate? I don't know. I want to finish the sentence, or I, I don't understand the sentence. Um, <laughs> Confidential but? And maybe that would be more clear that we, we yes, we still need to make the the appropriate um, reports as licensed clinicians, as most of the staff are. Um, so social workers, psychologists, that if somebody is talking about those mandated reporting categories, 
we do need to report them to the appropriate authorities, but not to other offices of the state bar. Thank you. Or as part of a, that, that also would not be disclosed in a public's records requests or disciplinary seating, et cetera. Okay. All right, so the next slide shows you where we were at for um, quite some time up until this past July. So this was the organization of the LAP. Still, as you could see, basically in, in two sections, but all in the Office of Professional Support and Client Protection. So in, in the Office of Professional Support and Client Protection, we had what we called the voluntary LAP, which I supervised. We had assigned to that part of the program, one admin staff, one senior analyst who is LIDA, and then two of our CRCs, the clinical rehabilitation coordinators. And the clinical rehabilitation coordinators are the ones who were doing the intake, the ongoing monitoring of people who were voluntarily monitored um, or people who were not being monitored but wanted the, the support of the program. So they still would do the same assessments, make recommendations for the person's um, recovery, and they would have access to our LAP support groups if they choose to attend those. Um, but the CRC is not making sure and collecting documentation that they are following the recommendations. And then there are those people who came in voluntarily because they wanted the support of LAP and they felt like the accountability of the monitoring would be helpful for them for themselves and um, for their own personal recovery or because they expected that at some point in the future they would want documentation to show to some um, authority. The other part was actually in the Office of Case Management and Supervision um, on the org chart, which was supervised by Terry Goldade, who was also supervising the Office of Probation. And on that side, we had those people, two CRCs and one admin staff, and those CRCs were doing the exact same things as the CRCs on the other side, but for the people who were referred by the court, um, who are being monitored by the Office of Probation, and people who are referred by the Office of Admission. Um, and so all of the people on that side were being monitored and the CRCs are writing the requested reports to whoever referred them about their compliance with their monitoring plan. So next slide, please. Then this past July, the way um, we reorganized, still two separate parts, but, um, but now the monitoring part stayed in the Office of Professional Support and Client Protection. Um, and I am managing that, that side all of the clinical rehabilitation coordinators, so all four of them are on that side, and one of the admin staff. And um, so the Terry Golded, for example, who is also managing the Office of Probation, is no longer involved with LAP on this side. And the support services are, is now part of the Office of Professional Competence, and Erica, as you know, is managing that side. And on that side, the um, the other admin staff, like we have before, it's the same, same human beings, the same two admin staff, um, same senior analyst, that's Lisa, um, another senior analyst who, this was a position that had been budgeted for, but had never been filled, and so now we're developing that new position. Um, Alex Ufik, who many of you know, has taken that position, so he will be the other senior analyst on that side. And what we didn't have before was one senior attorney that is not a person who is full-time with the LAP, but somebody in the Office of Professional Competence who also is going to be lending some of their expertise to help with projects that are happening on the support services side. So um, if you remember from the previous slide, we had CRCs on both sides, clinical rehabilitation coordinators, monitoring people on both sides. Now we've got all the CRCs together, which absolutely has been helping with their workflow and their ability to collaborate with each other, cover for each other, share their expertise about certain participants. It's been really, um, it's just been so helpful um, for the CRCs to be able to manage the cases. And um, and that, so that's why when I say this part of the monitoring is not changing at all, that's why this part is not changing at all because we are still doing the same things. Um, people can still come in to be monitored voluntarily because they're being asked to by somebody because they expect one day they will be asked to be uh, monitored by somebody. So the reasons people come in are still the same, um, but we've got all of the, the monitoring part concentrated on one side, and then the other side is freed up to do new projects, which is what we'll be talking about later. Um, so next slide, please. Whether it's, whether it's voluntary or disciplinary, you're gonna have the same counselors? 
rehabilitation coordinators? Yes. And so both both are <clears throat> involved in the same aspect. So you can come in voluntarily and you can come in with discipline and I'm gonna see both of you, right? Well, you would still have your one assigned clinical rehabilitation coordinator. So you would probably not work with both of us at the same time. But you're the participant in his. Oh, I'm I the think. participant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you, you come to me because you're voluntary. You want to get help, and she comes to me because she's dis in discipline. She's on probation, whatever it might be. Yes. And so I'm going to see both of you, and I'm going to determine everything as to both, right? Yes. So you still do assessments, still make what recommendations you think are appropriate for each person and their recovery process. And um, and monitor each the same. So our we, reasons for coming here. Doesn't and we change. interviewed participants to see how they react to that, how they react to knowing that the same person that is reporting the state bar on her discipline is reporting to, is not reporting the state bar on, about me, or you. Excuse me, as you participate. Um, I don't think we have directly asked participants about it, but I don't actually know that they really know the difference because they're still working with their same CRC. And the same person is still writing the reports close to the way things were. I mean, we're going back now. Like when I started in 2006, this is how we had it. people all mixed up, um, not separated by a mandatory voluntary. And the CRCs, you know, would know when a report is requested. I'm report writing reports. I can report on these people. These people not only are no reports going to be requested, but there's no releases, and they don't send reports on anyone. Okay, so if I want to participate then voluntarily, um, you think it would be important for me to know that I'm going to the same CRC that is reporting to discipline on people, uh, but I want to go there voluntarily. I don't want the state bar to know anything about me. I don't want the state bar to be involved with me. I don't want them to know anything about my life. I, I don't want them to know I'm an alcoholic. Uh, I think that would be covered all in informed consent, wouldn't it? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. We well, I'm sure it's on a piece of paper. Well, I don't know if it's on a piece of paper or not that this that all these people are involved with discipline as well as voluntary. Well, so and I'm I'm just trying to avoid a uh, an appearance of conflict or a reaction and uh, what outreach would do to pull people in, how they feel comfortable about that or uncomfortable about that. I'm just kind of thinking like as a mental health professional, when I do informed consent with somebody, they don't they don't actually have the privilege of knowing what other services I'm providing. It's really only like this consent applies to our interactions, if that makes sense. Sure. Um, and so the the consent process would just be where your specific information would go. Okay. And how about uh, what <clears throat> the the ability for outreach to to get people to want to be participants in the program if they know that the same counselor is going to be have dual hats how does that how do you think that might affect the public the person who wants to involve themselves voluntarily well i guess so like i've been in a situation where i worked for a probation office where some of my clients were mandated and some were not um and and i think it's kind of similar but really it's just the the consent process that you're going through with that individual person applies to their case. And so then you would basically outline very clearly where the disclosures could go. And at that point, it becomes almost just like a record keeping issue. And like mm -hmm. the counselors would just know what bin to put different files in. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think it's different from attorneys in that when we screen, we want to make sure that we're not you know, it's very clear in the professional rules of conduct that we can't kind of talk out of both sides of our mouth and say, like, we're going to represent this person in their civil case, and then we're going to go sue, like, the same company or a different company for the same reason that we're, like, defending this person. Right. So, but in mental health, it's different because it's a very clear line between what can be released and what can't be released. And it's like, it's not a conflict um, under their rules of professional conduct because there's there's they're not advocating for anybody they're not saying like this is my perspective they're basically saying here's the person here's how they're getting monitored and 
this report in particular will go to the state bar, but this person's not being monitored for that purpose. So there will be no report generated for that person. I don't know if that makes sense. I think the but conflict could come if, it, if there was a crossover at any point where it yeah. goes from voluntary to mandatory. And then that I'm assuming would be a different situation because they've disclosed things under voluntary that we wouldn't want to right. then report back. But, but that's again, kind of like the, a single client, not necessarily in different clients, if that makes sense. Okay. Uh, I think those are all important points, but so, um, is there any room for any of these four clinical rehabilitation coordinators to be, uh, segregated to voluntary or segregated to disciplinary or do you have enough clients that are voluntary that one person could handle them all? Or, I mean, is there enough to make that separation? Well, that is, and I know you've been trying to say something, but let me. Yeah, no, 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 go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> That's essentially what we had before. And that actually was the idea that sounded good and ended up making things more complicated because we had the voluntary side, we had the mandatory side. And the problem was that the mandatory side were people who were referred, for example, by the state bar court or admissions. So they come over here to the mandatory side. Then you've got people who are calling and they're saying, I had a DUI last week. I had this problem. I'm coming in voluntarily. So they come on the voluntary side. Well, it turns out the state bar is going to find out about that DUI. And eventually the state bar is going to want some kind of discipline. They're going to want information. And then that person has to switch from this side of the program to this side. So they're switching their, their case man, their CRC at the time that they decide they want us to start reporting, which is disruptive. We managed it. it, it was fine. But one of the things that this does now is it reduces the disruption when somebody wants to start reporting. Okay, but well we just get a release signed and then now we can start <laughs> reporting at that, at that point. And the people who are coming in voluntarily, but knowing at some point that discipline is coming, don't have to figure that out at the beginning to know which side to put them on. Everybody comes in, we monitor them all. And if there are people that want this, want the support only, they, they, this is now what we're going to talk about developing with these new support services. Um, so the people who are coming in voluntarily, who want the monitoring, that's their choice. They can come in, we'll monitor them just like everybody else. No one's requesting reports. We're not reporting anything. The CRC, I will probably be happy about that because it's less work to do, not something else that they're going to have to figure out. And then if they don't want that, then that's why we're going to be developing the new services. So anyone can come over if they want to voluntarily, but it is possible that as this process and as the years go on and we develop more and more, we'll have fewer people coming to be voluntarily monitored because they, if they don't need the monitoring, they'll be getting the services over here on the support side. And then there won't be any conflict about reporting. So as the voluntary develops into the disciplinary, instead of having the, just this automatic changeover or sharing of information within the same counselor as what I am perceiving you're talking about, can't the person just write an authorization and say, I now authorize the same counselor to see me about the discipline that I authorized for voluntary and that way, or I don't authorize the same person to see me about discipline I authorized for voluntary because I don't want that stuff shared. Hey, so going back to the statute, what I'm what I'm hearing in all of this and what I'm thinking is so um, to participate in the mandatory monitoring, just to call it that, um, you are as an individual in the, in those programs, you're required to as part of it to participate. Like let's say you've been disciplined by the state bar uh, by the Supreme Court, but you know you're on probation as recommended by the state bar court. Um, as part of that, you have to agree to sign certain um, waivers, right? So if you go back to what it was said said in the statute 6234, confidentiality is absolute unless waived by the participant. Right. I would think, assuming you have the same CRC, hypothetically, and you started in the voluntary aspect of Michelle, please weigh in here, the waiver could have a timing, a timing uh, trigger, essentially. So when you were voluntary, you're not giving a waiver for that information, but the minute you become in the mandatory monitoring component of it, that's when that waiver would apply to. So anything, let's say you're, you start being in the mandatory monitoring, just to make it clear what we're talking about, effective February 1st, 
anything pre-February 1st would not have been waived, but anything post would be for participation. I don't know if that helps anything, but. No, it makes sense, but it doesn't make sense to me to have the same person responsible for the counseling that I'm going to have voluntary and oh. mandatory. If I don't want the new one to know what the old one did. Yes, so maybe this is the piece that's um, missing. They're not doing counseling. They are not providing therapy. Oh, I didn't, yeah. I didn't. That, that's However, the. But go ahead. Finish and then I'll. So the, the CRCs are all licensed clinicians, which is why we, we're talking about the reporting things, but they are not in that role to do therapy. So if somebody needs therapy, it's we refer them out. It's I not just, provided I by somebody. About I'm sorry. I understood that. Okay. Maybe you're thinking about the group participation, the, the participation groups, because those are mixed and those have the same licensed counselor who runs those groups. And um, people relative, you know, speak pretty openly. So everyone in that group knows who is in for what. I mean, right. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, you're encouraged to, to, to talk about it. So everyone knows like why people come and why they're there um and so that counselor does provide reports for at least for the monitoring um so maybe it's in that setting that your concern would be raised actually i was just concerned with who's overseeing my particular situation so the clinical <laughs> rehabilitation coordinator is what i'm talking about okay but I appreciate what you're saying, but I think that all of the group sessions would be totally confidential anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, it's so pretty anyway, well. I anyway, think that's a couple sized. What I'm hearing, Jim, and, and I think for everyone is, and I'm taking notes on, what are some things we need to kind of look at and, and button up, right? So now that we have this kind of new format, this is one area where we need to look at confidentiality. What what does our informed consent look like? What, you know, how are we going to handle people who are voluntary? What, you know, just that's that's an, an area for us to look at. And as we develop out, I, I think it really will fall on the monitoring side from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. If people are been going to be referred to monitoring and voluntarily want to do monitoring particularly, then how how does that work? How do we inform them? What do the forms look like? What, we can just identify that as an issue that we want to tackle this year. Okay. I, have a, I have a question as it relates to all of this. What happens if a CRC is not a good fit for that individual? currently because maybe that's something where that the individual could speak up if they have been in voluntary monitoring and then they want to they if they wanted a new crc in jim's scenario would they be able to switch currently yes actually with the old model there were only two options right. CRC mm -hmm. <laughs> so now there is at least four options and so there are more people to handle the cases um it's really rare though because the it's they're not doing therapy, so it's not like you need to right. find a good match with a therapist. It's somebody who's going to write reports for you after you know your, all your initial intake stuff, the the ongoing participation. So it's it's it it has happened. It's you know I don't even think it's like a once a year occurrence that somebody asks for they're not getting along with their CRC and they want to switch. But yes, it is possible. So perhaps that's something we could consider as it relates to your concern, where they're just made aware of how how things are changing and how that impacts them to the informed consent consideration. And then giving them perhaps an option, um, something for certainly to consider, I think, to switch CRCs if they wanted to at that point. Okay. And uh, if you would make sure you consider marketing as well, because uh, when we're doing outreach and talking to people, their perceptions of and how they can be protected in this program are important to them. I see marketing as a more important issue than the separation, actually, mm -hmm. because if we're marketing to people and we're saying we're going to give you support services and suddenly they're being monitored and they don't know they're being monitored that could be a problem um but i think that the whole monitoring like at the end of the day everybody's being monitored it's just like you said there's a time limited release or a specific start time for a release for a given individual if they switch over to the reporting program under for the state bar but if they're not then the CRC knows that this information doesn't get released. Like you have to, as, as the CRC, as a case manager, like my understanding is that they have to know their, I don't know if they call them clients or whatever. Mm -hmm. They have to know their clients and they have to know what can be released and when. And that's why you have a 
release form in the file. So before you do anything, you should be saying, am I allowed to release this information? Mm -hmm. And if I am, then it then it falls here. If I'm not, then I can't release it. So there's to me, there's no real just like conflict in that sense, but that's just my opinion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Think, having dealt with both situations simultaneously, it's actually not that difficult to keep track of like what goes where and mm -hmm. and I'm assuming most mental health professionals check before they send anything. I usually check at least five times. <laughs> anywhere. Yes. And and it helps it helps prevent people from getting into this bind of thinking, I'm I, I don't I don't need money, I'm going the support side. And what we we still have the concept of support labs so that people are coming in and they're they're getting the recommendations, the same things, but not being monitored on it. And then it gets to a point where they're like, oh, I need to start sending reports now. Well, you haven't been monitored. We don't know whether you're doing what we've recommended it, but you haven't provided documentation. You haven't been doing the testing, so we can't report on you. And then they're, excuse the expression, they're SOL. And so they start have to start at that point and they can't get reports going back from when we weren't monitoring them. So, um, so it, it does help solve that problem. And yes, everybody does know if they're being monitored. They signed a monitoring plan. The, the CRC goes over it with them so they know exactly the date that they sign it, what's being monitored, what they have to do. Um, as much as when I came into this job, I assumed that attorneys read everything very carefully. <laughs> as, as much as they do not, that is not a conflict I think we've ever had before of somebody not knowing <laughs> whether, right. they're, whether they're being monitored or not. I think that's actually a good point too because we were thinking of the people that don't want any of the, vol the voluntary information being transferred over, but we actually, you probably have the inverse of that, for the most part, the people that are going to show up for monitoring on a voluntary basis who want to show the good they've been doing yes. in their probation case or what, mm -hmm. or what have you, so they were before the state bar court. So they're actually, there will be the situations where they don't want any of that information shared, but there are mm -hmm. also the situations where they will actually want the, the waiver they signed to, to predate their, yeah. their mandatory monitoring program. No, they're coming in because often they want to document the sobriety so they can prove it for, you know, they're in law school and they know that these DUIs or drug related arrests are going to come up when they're going through the moral character process and it's going to be asked about. And somebody fortunately told them, start making a track record and go to meetings and get get cards signed and start doing the testing and document that you're sober. So they're coming in voluntarily because nobody has told them to, but what they want is monitoring. And now they don't have to decide what they're doing. If it's somebody that what what we're able to focus on is the professional monitoring and that's what we're doing and that's what the goal is and if somebody wants help with something they want referrals to a therapist or they want help with like the career counseling that's what we'll be developing on the support services side so we'll be really clear when people want professional monitoring this is what we're very good at and this is what we offer and you come here but if that's not what you want you don't have to come here this is not the only place to get support there's going to be someplace else now to get support and then we will talk about it later. Okay. Um, I don't want to forget about Martin or Tracy. <laughs> They're not on the screen. So, um, do either of you have anything to add? I don't. This is Tracy. I don't have anything to add. I, I reviewed those slides beforehand, so I had no questions. Okay. So, the next slide was a summary of really what I already said in the monitoring program. Um, we do the intake, they've got licensed mental health clinicians who are the CRCs, we'll do the intake, and then the referrals help them find um, therapists. If we think therapists appropriate, they'll go to the lab group um, testing. And then the, is that the same slide? Support. Oh, yes. Yeah, so then slide. she already forwarded to the support services yeah. slide, which is... Um, do you want to take this part? Sure. Right, um, yeah. So what support services currently looks like, and then we, we're going to perhaps talk about what it what we may want it to look like in the future. But so there are um, two free short-term career counseling sessions that are offered to individuals. Um, and there are two free um, individual sessions with a, with a therapist that are offered. Um, and then under what has been offered as support lab is the orientation and assessment. It was with a, a CRC. Um, and they were offered, you know, to participate in the in the group programs, and they were offered um, essentially recommendations as to what they should be doing, which may have involved recommending they go through um, 
drug and alcohol monitoring, which was, correct me if I'm wrong, it, it could have, it was through LAP. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is where that area and what the individual, we're going to, nothing's changing in regards to the career counseling sessions that are being offered. Nothing's changing in regards to the two um, individual counseling sessions that are offered. But what we're looking at with this change to allow for um, anyone to go through monitoring is if there should be any changes to that individual um, orientation and assessment and um, the, you know, the, the three free group sessions and then their ability to continue to participate in the group sessions and so on, if there should be any changes to that and what those changes might look like. Um, and we'll dive into this a little bit more this afternoon, but any changes to that, just to make, to set kind of where we are, would likely require a rule change, not necessarily a statutory change, <laughs> but a rule change. And so there, there are the state bar rules over the lawyer assistance program, um, and those rules reflect the old model. And so any change to that would obviously would be um, rules that would ultimately require approval by the Board of Trustees, but would be things that are worked out, you know, within this committee. And it's just at the Board of Trustees level. It's not like what Randy talked about earlier. It doesn't have to go to the California Supreme Court. It doesn't have to go to the state legislature unless there are major changes we're talking about yeah. that would require a statutory change. But as it relates to kind of the, you know, the, the statutes lay out kind of the the forest and the rules of the trees. So any change to, to those trees, unless they conflict with, with the statute would be something that is approved at the Board of Trustees level after a public comment process for those rules and so on. And you'll see, or, and, or if you have already looked at the slides, we have a lot more detail about both of these areas later. Right, yeah. And then um, Jennifer, if you just wanna to advance to the next slide. So just a reminder for where we are currently and what has been offered as part of the support um, lab program. So uh, the education and outreach and, you know, in the past education and outreach was essentially Lita. Uh, so, and, and she's done a great job in, in doing that education and outreach. And she's reached a, a lot of people and we're gonna be talking about all of the outreach she has done and all the people that she's reached, you know, just in this past year alone. What, um, why education outreach got moved into the Office of Professional Competence is because that is essentially what um, a large part of what the Office of Professional Competence does at this point is preventative education and outreach. And certainly an aspect of that is education and outreach regarding um, substance use and mental health issues and the lawyer assistance program as a resource. But we also handle, you know, uh, preventative education regarding like client trust accounting, for example, and just the rules of professional conduct more generally. And so um, looking at where there are crossover issues in this and kind of seeing everything from a big picture standpoint is a reason that this is in now in our office and just to have more resources. So as Michelle pointed out earlier, Lita continues to be, um, you know, the, the primary person providing the education outreach regarding the competency um, MCLE course. She continues to provide outreach to law schools and law students. And, um, you know, if we can, if we expand upon the outreach that we are providing and provide you know, different courses, for example, we now have a second senior program analyst that can assist in that role. And then we also have the senior attorney in our office who can consult on these things as well and provide input. So we have more staff coming out of um, dedicated to education and outreach than has existed in the past. So who will be doing education and outreach now? So Lita continues to do it. And then we have a senior program analyst, that's Alex Ufik, who was hired. He started in OPC effective on uh, this past Monday. Monday. Yeah, <laughs> so we are officially fully staffed. Um, and then um, Jennifer does a, supports all of that work that, that Lita's currently doing um, when those presentations are hosted by the state bar. Um, and then we also have a senior um, education attorney who works on that as well, to a certain extent. And her role is not full-time as it relates to LAP, but just she will be providing assistance on that too. Okay, so I don't know what a senior program analyst is or a senior education attorney. Sorry, but I don't know what those things are. So can you tell me what those are? Sure. So those are uh, job titles. Essentially, we'll be doing what uh, the senior program analyst, that's the same title that Lita has. So developing presentations, um, you know, working with other offices, such as the Office of Communications, to um, market those presentations, giving the presentations themselves. So that's an aspect of that. And then um, the senior attorney, a, a lot of the presentations that she's working on involve, you know, interpreting laws and statutes. And so that's why she has that role. Um, and so as it relates to the, the um, work she's doing regarding 
the, some of the other programs we're doing and developing the content and evaluating, you know, what attorney's obligations are under certain rules of professional conduct and the statutes. Um, she does that. So as it relates to the lawyer assistance program work, I don't, we're not sure yet if it will involve doing some of those things as it relates to the lab education and outreach, but something to consider. So she's kind of behind the scenes, what, what we need to do, the basic. Correct. Yes. Okay. And so, so Lita will be in partnership with Alex to do outreach then generally speaking, active outreach, you know, go give presentations, that sort of thing. Yes. So what the, so Lita's presentation is going to continue to She's going to continue to provide her one hour MCLE presentation. What we're hoping to do is that we're going to expand the types of outreach and education that we provide. So as we'll talk about this afternoon, there's um, proposals to talk about other topics, you know, such as um, law practice management, um, you know, aging issues, things of that nature. And so expanding these things is what that new senior program analyst will do. And we'll talk about this again later today, but also developing um, not just presentations, but other resources for attorneys. So be it, we're looking into um, a attorney resource page that will provide, yeah, you know, really information for attorneys. Yeah. So all of these things are things that we're working on and, you know, not in a vacuum. So we're working collaboratively with several other offices and we can get to this later. You know, we're going to be hearing in an, in an anonymized way, what issues the CRCs are experiencing as it relates to the participants so that we can do this in a way that you know it's not just us thinking of things that may make sense but it's actually hearing from the stakeholders in this and seeing you know what actually is needed thank you do you feel like having a half-time attorney or part-time whoever she's working is sufficient for you to get your your job done or do you feel like that it needs more attention than what she's currently able to give based on her workload so as it affects lab because yes. she's a full she's right. a full time. No, no, no. Yeah. I knew that. Yeah, I was okay. just saying because you guys are only getting part of her time. So yeah, I think for right now it's certainly sufficient. Um, we had a really big project that she was working very heavily in the client trust account protection program for uh, those of you who are lawyers here. Um, that was taking a lot of um, this individual's time, but that has gone into effect as of a few days ago. So I think as a resource, um, she'll be able to de de dedicate more time to lab in 2023 and forward. But if we have a lot of ideas, maybe that'll change. Yeah, it might. And that's what we're hoping, you know, to the extent this committee wants to be involved in some of that, we, we'd love to, you know, utilize you as well. So I mean, recognize yeah. this is a volunteer role, but yeah. I think that that's something. We oh, can what do. I meant is like, you know, if we come up with ideas for new programs or different, different resources, sure. yeah, you may be taking more of our time. And yeah. yeah. I want to encourage that. <laughs> I do too. I mean, I already told them that I'm happy to like step in, particularly on the education and like outreach piece. Great. Yeah, I think it's, we'll talk later too, but I think we'll just like see how it's going and what, you know, that's what we'll be in partnership with you on and how it's yeah. going and what we need to do to change it or if we have sufficient resources or not as we go. Great. Is that the last Okay, I think that was the last slide of this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Are we oh, so we're we're done with recent development. That was just the correct. Yes, we've done our recent development. So yes. We're going to move to the D1 uh, overview and discussion of monitoring lab. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And um. Oh, can, can we take a break? Like yeah, five five minutes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. And, and if anyone ever wants to break, like just <laughs> say, can we take a break? Yeah. So um, just like for the people on Zoom, do you want to return 11.25 or 11.30, 5 or 10? That's good. Let's, Whatever. Let's do I'm good either way. I'm, I don't need a break, but I'm good. <laughs> yeah, me too. 25 is fine. Okay. Let's, let's do 11.25. Okay. Okay. Because, you, know, you probably have money. Oh, oh that's okay. Let's no worries. Right. You can, I noticed, and I was like, that works. And, and then you can, like, sure Jennifer, you can pause the recording. Yeah, <laughs> see, we're exactly, you know, I love it. I love it. That's awesome. And you'll want to uh, mute the room, too. What is it, 1125. Hello. So, the assumption that couple's starting on. She's going to pop it just to. I don't, I'm not sure if I could do the share if I pause the recording. Oh, you can. Go. Okay. <laughs> and uh are we still like live 
webinar. We should be. Series. I'm not getting a. You are in practice session. Um, okay. Okay. It says webinar speed. Tracy or Martin, do you see okay. a you are in practice session message? Uh, I don't see it. It looks normal. <laughs> thank okay. You. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm on as a too. public member, so I can I can see where we're. Thanks. Ready to roll. Oh, I see Leah Wilson's here. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, I was just going to say, I see that Leah has joined us. I'm not sure. There she is. <laughs> Walking back. <laughs> Hi, Leah. We're I'm just so coming sorry. back from a little, a little break. So I know you just wanted to kind of sit in for a little while. If you wanted to say anything, feel free. This is a good time. And then we're going to get back into our, our presentations here. Okay. No, what, um, I'm not sure exactly where you are in your agenda. So I was hoping to just be able to participate in kind of a planning focused conversation. I, I don't want to interrupt the flow though. So why don't you continue on and then maybe I can chime in or yeah, that sounds questions fine. for me. Okay, great. Um, yeah. And then we just wanted to Melanie to introduce herself too, real quick. Sure. Sorry about that. My, my name is Melanie Lawrence. Um, I am the program director over the uh, Office of Professional Support and Client Protection. The Lawyers Assistance Program, uh, the monitoring side of it, is uh, one of my programs. <clears throat> so I've been at the bar for 17 years, um, mostly in the Office of Chief Trial Counsel. Uh, and then I moved over here in uh, the 1st of June. So are you an attorney too? I am an attorney. <laughs> Lots of attorneys up here. <laughs> well, I wasn't sure because I was like, LAP has all these different like roles. Yes. And so I was like, I don't know. I don't want to say. Did you start with the OCTC? I did. So 2005? Yes. Mike Miss Barrows? Uh, Scott Rexel. Right. Okay. So the first, you put up the slide, the PowerPoints of the one that says title monitoring. So, Justin, I'll start with um, D1. Yep. This um, topic is. Hold on, I have to, I'm sorry, I have to log in to the VPN through my cell. No, that's okay. I thought I was teaming up while you're fine. Talk about uh, maybe going out of order um, based on the agenda and doing item D1 and D3 together. Perfect. We did talk about, yes. And then do item D2 and D4 together, just to keep, you know, the topics together. Yes. Yeah, we weren't sure when we were planning it, what would make more sense to give all the background and then do all the planning or give background and planning on one side and background and planning on the other side. So I guess we'll see what happens. But, yeah. um, but up first is monitoring. Program anyhow. So while Jennifer is looking for the slides, I will tee it up that we are talking about monitoring parts. So of course we already did talk about some of this because it just came up organically in our previous conversation. So um and there would be issue that PowerPoint, not the PDF. This is really bad tea. This is good? No, it's really bad. I added a black tea because I was like, I'm tired, so I wanted to like wake up. But the apple cinnamon in the black was <laughs> <is> really <laughs> terrible. Good. Yesterday, public service announcement. I said, but I said, I'm all it. Don't come Don't come by. Oh, okay. Let's see. I can so I'll, okay. I'll start talking about it. It's so the idea here is to give you. Um, like we've said before, because some of you are very new and some of you have been involved for a long time and are rusty on it and some of you never knew the, the details of what we do. This will give you more of a um, in the weeds picture of what is happening in the monitoring program, um, kind of more of what the experience would be like if you're a participant coming into the program, actually like literally what the paperwork is that you're looking at. And, um, and it's purposeful, you will see later when we get into the, um, the action planning section of the day, uh, why some of these things are brought up and why I'm talking about these specific types of paperwork, but the professional monitoring period. So what we start with is person calls for monitoring, right? We've already established why people come in and the first thing that they will do after we get their 
basic contact information is meet with one of the clinical rehabilitation coordinators. Since COVID now, we've been able to do Zoom meetings. So it's been um, much more streamlined and quick to be able to get people in rather than having people from around the state needing to go to an office or trying to step up by phone. So that's been great. Um, the, the CRC will do an assessment which is talking about all their history, why they're coming in now, but their history of substance use problems, mental health problems, some family history, work, um, and then they will make the initial recommendations for what they're going to be um, doing in the monitoring plan in order to support the recovery. So um, the first, when you get the slide, you will see it says to clarify the issues to make the appropriate recommendations. So this is if the person is coming in for a mental health issue, if they're coming in for substance abuse, to try and start getting an idea of what the diagnosis might be. And the first approximate 90 days in the LAP is what we call the evaluation period. So they will start doing the things that the CRC has recommended. One of the things most of the time is they will recommend the LAP support group, which is what Justin was talking about. Those groups are an hour and a half, one time a week, all led by um, licensed clinicians. They are not therapy groups. They are monitoring groups and support groups, but we have clinicians leading them um, kind of for the same purpose we have clinicians working in the program because one, we are clarifying what the diagnosis is. They are involved in the diagnosing, which is one of the requirements to be admitted to the monitoring program and to be able to um, know what the issues are, like know what the appropriate treatment is for the issues, e even if somebody else is actually doing the treatment, but they'll know what is supposed to be happening with the participants in the program when they're reporting back and they're able to deal with crises if somebody is suicidal or who knows what's going on with them. The um, group facilitators are the people who are available 24 hours that the participants have their um, their phone number if they need. That's very rare that somebody's calling after hours, um, but that lap group is support. So it's very much what the participants make of it for the people who are coming for the support of the group. Um, as with any kind of, well, I was going to say therapy, but like ex any experience you get out of it, what you put into it. So there are people who, who really do um, find this to be an extremely supportive environment for them. So much so that we have some people who have been parts, there was somebody from my original caseload who's still in the program, like for over a decade that people still come to the groups just not for the monitoring because they find it supportive and helpful. And this is the community that they've developed. Yes. Do the CRCs actually do diagnoses? They do. Like so determine like what is what is their, you know, mental health diagnosis or substance abuse? Yes, diagnosis. it's a provisional diagnosis for the purpose of treatment planning um, and for the purpose of seeing if they meet the criteria to admit them. Okay. Um, but yes, that's one of the things that's that's really what they're they're looking at when they're doing that assessment at the beginning. And then um, and then they're going to the lab group. So that group facilitator will get to know a person and in that first 90 days be able to formulate their idea of what's going on with that person at the same time, if it's appropriate, which it generally is in the beginning to start somebody on the biological fluid testing. Um, we'll get a set, you know, people can tell you anything they want to. We want to see what's in their system actually matches what they're telling us that they are or are not doing. And um, and I say biological fluid testing instead of urine testing. It used to be just urine testing since COVID. You know, the, the testing that urgent care centers, people would go and give their urine sample and nobody wanted to go to an urgent care if they didn't have to during COVID. So the company that we contract with to do the testing, luckily was able to, um, to develop, I mean, they didn't create it, but to get going with the oral fluid testing. So we have home video monitored oral fluid collection, they get kits that they have at home. If they're selected to test, they make an appointment with the online collection and the collector goes through making sure, watching them do the swabs, seal everything, put in the FedEx envelope, and then they can send it in. Um, so that's all part of these first 90 days. At the end of the 90 days, we have a clinical review team meeting. So, and like I said, it's approximate 90 days, sometimes there are people who don't follow the recommendations at the beginning, and there's a lot of time spent like checking and sign up for the testing. They haven't done it yet. They haven't started yet. So at 90 days, we have very little information about them. So we might push it longer. Oh, sorry, I have a question about. Sure. 
So they're, they're doing groups during this time. Yes. How much communication is there between the group facilitator and the CRC? There's weekly communication. Um, the group facilitators do not share, you know, a transcript really of what's talked about in group. They need to report after the group every week. They're expected by noon the next day to let us know with, you know, the system that we have who was in the group so that we know if somebody was not there, we can find out whether it was an excused reason for not coming or if they're out of compliance for just a no-show, <laughs> unexcused misgroup. And then they will give a little summary of what's happened, you know, a sentence, a couple sentences about um, what's going on with that person. Um, so it's like I said, there, it's the support, but that's the monitoring aspect of it. And they'll check in with, you know, how, what, what somebody's doing in terms of their monitoring in the groups, if they're going to meetings, if their, you know, problems came up with testing that week, sometimes comes up. So, um, so then the clinical review team meeting involves essentially all the clinicians involved with that person and, and the staff clinicians. So it's all of the CRCs. By the way, um, that was really one of the benefits of changing this structure because before we only had the two CRCs available um, for these meetings, and that's very thin if somebody is sick that day or we're trying to schedule. Um, and it's less people there for support. So now we've got, ideally, at each of those meetings, we'll have four CRCs when we're fully staffed, um, myself, the group facilitator, and the participant attending that meeting. And we we do them via Zoom now. We try and keep it informal. It's it's not um, supposed to be a scary process. We've worked really hard from those of you who remember in the old days when we had the evaluation committees, which was much more, <laughs> don't laugh, which were much more intimidating. And like we were talking about we're sitting with a panel on one side judging you and so. Yeah. In the State Bar building. In the State Bar building. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds really therapeutic, right? Exactly. <laughs> so, um, so we'll we'll meet to talk about how things are going. Um, does the person meet the criteria? So, is there a diagnosis? Most often, participants will fully, fully just say, "Yeah, like yes, I'm here. This is the problem. This is what I want to work on." Um, in the more difficult cases, somebody is coming in and saying, I was told to come here, but I don't have a problem. And then it's, well, let's talk about what we've observed, what you've told us, why we think, so and sometimes it might be that we do agree. We have not seen any evidence of a problem. We haven't seen anything in the history. Tests have been clean and they might've just been referred so they could check off that box to know that they had experts looking at them and, and things are fine. Um, or explain to that person why we think things are not fine and why um, we're making the recommendations that we are. Um, we admit them, we'll go over the monitoring plan, that's a good time, we'll make adjustments if things need to be changed. If um, if it does seem that they're here only for mental health issues, we can um, take off the testing or suspend the testing so they're not doing that all the time after we've gotten through that diagnostic period. And, um, and then they will continue on. Now, so on the slide it says, we're admitting them to monitoring substance use mental health disorder, which I mentioned, so that's why we need the diagnosis. And then um, if they're able to substantially benefit, that's the part that gets sometimes more difficult um, that we could put a flag on at some point if the committee wants to talk about um, the admissions criteria because, um, because sometimes people come in who aren't able to benefit for, like I you know when I said, there are people who sometimes aren't appropriate to go to group very rarely, but there are occasions when you have people who um, who either have a, a personality disorder that is just unmanaged and they're not gonna be able to sit in a group of people and behave appropriately because they're so combative or um, just oppositional or people who are refusing to follow any of the recommendations we make that at that point we'd say, we either can't admit you now or we can extend the evaluations if they say I, I'm, I'm going to do it now I'm going to fall okay so we'll extend it and then we'll come back again and meet with them um the ongoing case management then after that meeting thanks Jennifer um you know we'll highlight it there again that we're not doing the treatment but we the CRCs will make sure that the person is connecting to resources treatment resources um helping them find abstinence-based self-help groups, if they're having a hard time doing that, individual therapy, psychiatric medication management, and then it's the ongoing monitoring and reporting if there's somebody we're reporting to. 
I do have a question if I can ask. Sure. Kind of going back to the intake assessment and evaluation period, is that considered part of monitoring as well so that yes. um, it gets reported to like the state bar or whatever if they're mandatory LAP yes. participants? If okay. we have a release, then yes. Well, that will include <laughs> yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah. assuming yeah. there's a release. Okay. Yeah. So here's some numbers. Last time this committee met, you all had asked for some numbers, statistics about people coming in. So here's some of these um, monitoring numbers. The year to date for this year was at the end of last month. So not for not including December, but where we're at so far um, with intakes, it doesn't show up on the screen here like it did on my computer screen, but the darker blue line on the left um, are the intakes. So those are new. Um, open files, people who come in and they do that, that first intake, basically. And then the closed cases on the right are the number of people who leave. That could be for any reason. If they just kind of disappear on us and after all our attempts, we close the file because we haven't reached them, or they just withdraw because they had come voluntarily and they decided they got what they needed and now they're done, or they graduate or they finish um, probation or whatever it is. So can you... Tell us, I know that the math would probably lie to me, so I'm <laughs> going to ask you, uh, you know, your intakes and your closed cases are smaller or higher or higher and smaller. And so how many are carried over? How many active cases do you have at any one period of time? Do we have at any one period of time? We do have ac active cases, which <laughs> is deceptively hard to find out. So I got these numbers from our annual reports. So I believe I would have to go back to the annual report because I believe we did start reporting what the number was of carryover cases and then adding these on. So it has the total number served for that year. So it was in the like right, so, hundreds I mean, generally. I mean, even though like the last period you got 161 and 152, there might be 300 active cases going on. Right, right. Yeah, we do kind of tend to balance over the year with the numbers that are coming in and out, like for all of this year, the caseloads have been in the high 160, low 170 overall with all the caseloads combined. Um, so we end up with 160 something, 170 something people in the program enrolled at any one time. Can you get us that data? Like that data point about how many people? Huh? How, oh, go ahead, sorry. I'm just how, looking at the annual report. Oh, yeah. oh, I guess I can look at the annual report. How are the CRCs finding in terms of caseload management? Is it doable? Do, are they overworked, underworked? Well, honestly, it's tough right now, but we're not fully staffed right now, which is the problem. And so because what we talked, you know, with that, um, we talked about the senior analyst position opening, Alex Ufik, who you don't know, but some of the members do, was one of the CRCs and has moved over to the other side. So that position is vacant. Um, we're in the hiring process. We're hoping somebody will start in January. So uh, we're hoping that in January it will become, it, it will smooth out and be more manageable, but they've been working hard. How, what's their current like caseload count? Do you know, like the average? Um, it is, I don't have an average, but you know, there's only yeah, three I mean, of them. So it's, yeah. it's 40 to 50. Okay. Right now, yeah. I think the report says the average is 164 active cases over the last three years, so 50 ish each, each yeah. divided by three, yeah, yeah, and yeah, and so I have I have 30 something that I'm managing right now, so yeah, between them, it's the CRCs. I, yeah, it's, it's been a lot. All right, um, questions on this before we go to the next slide. All right, so this one talks about the reason that people come into the program. So this is at intake. Of course, we might discover other things along the way of somebody's participation, but at the time that they first call us up, this is what they, the reason they say they are coming into the problem to deal with the substance use issue, a mental health issue, or both. So that cluster on the left is the substance use issues, cluster all the way on the right is only for mental health, and then the middle is for both by year. So what's interesting about this is, for example, year to date, this year, we have a lot of people who are coming in for both. They have, these people have a lot, a lot going on. It used to be 
that the LAP was seen as a place for people to go with substance use problems. And this is where people go with addiction. And, um, and, and really you can see here, if you just take out the problems with addiction, the majority of people are here for mental health. It might also be an addiction, but if you're combining the mental health and the both, um, we have a lot of people here with mental health problems. And so that also might inform some of the, the conversation later when we talking about what directions to grow. What, what are the primary, I guess, categories of diagnoses that you're seeing? Um, in terms of like mental health, anxiety and depression, absolutely uh, the highest. Um, so when we're talking about intakes, this is what they tell you at the time that they mm -hmm. come in. Yes. So what do you, what is kind of the average diagnosis once the clinicians get a sort of get a look at them and figure it out? Do we know? It, it's usually similar. Okay. And I didn't include on here because the number was so small. And, and by the way, this is a percentage. This is not the raw number. So it's not like 25 oh, okay. people yeah. came yeah. in. Um, so it didn't really even register as a bar there's like one or two percent i don't even know if any year it was two percent who said nothing or didn't respond okay. so in those cases sometimes we might find things that weren't there often it's really similar from what they identify at the beginning okay. so you think that the people who come in with mental health issues depression and stuff like that they don't have a dual diagnosis most of them or a lot of them? um well the ones in the middle do 51 percent do 51 percent this year have both uh, percent when they come in they state that they have both right. i mean and i think that that's attributable a lot to the marketing nowadays and the efforts by our outreach to to talk about wellness and how the the two are interrelated <clears throat> and it's i think making an impact on people who are listening to those presentations but i'm curious about the okay i come in and my stated reason for coming here is i'm depressed but really, I'm a raging alcoholic, and I'm guilt. I feel terrible about that, and uh, so I have this issue. But mm -hmm. I don't want to disclose the issue. Yes, that would not be reflected here because this is just what they're saying at the beginning at intake. But that is that is exactly why we put people in the biological fluid testing the majority of the time at intake for that evaluation period. Because that does happen that we have somebody who says they're here for mental health, put them on testing, they're positive for alcohol eventually. And that is a very good diagnostic tool to be able to see if you're not able to abstain when you're in a monitoring program and you know somebody's going to find out, what does that mean to you? And it's a really good way to start opening that up for them. All right, thanks. Do you find that it's generally consistent when we're talking about, like, if someone comes in and says, I just have a mental health issue, like, do you find that it's pretty consistent that they only have the mental health or the substance abuse, or do you find more often that people are actually really having a dual diagnosis and they're just kind of like assessing it, that, you know, one way or the other? Mm -hmm. We don't have um, a way actually to track that, like if what they come in with is the same as what we admit them for after the evaluation period. So I don't have specific data that I can tell you. Anecdotally, um, I don't feel like it, it's very rare that we're in an evaluation committee meeting surprised that you know what they said is different than what we thought it was at the beginning. Yeah. Okay. Questions? Okay. Next slide, please. <laughs> so. What I wanted to do was show you what some of these documents look like so you know what the participants are seeing, what they're signing. You could just kind of load them all up there, Jennifer. So the next slides will have the monitoring plan, participation report. So this is um, wording from the monitoring plan. It'll cover a couple of slides. So the beginning of the monitoring plan has these bullet points, um, which is why it'll be good that you can access these slides if you want to read them more carefully. And I, I put the box around that last one because that's what we were talking about. That explains what the evaluation period is and what we're doing um, after the, that's a 60 or 90 days. It really depends on um, how much time we need with that person. And um, we do the, the CRT meetings every other week. So how will we get with those meetings? Okay, so that's what it says. Next slide, please. That's what it says at the beginning of the monitoring plan. 
Then there's three parts to it, part A, B, and C. Part A are the things that are specific to that person. So after that first assessment, the CRC will put some suggestions on there. This, I don't, this is not necessarily any individual's plan, but these are examples. It will be the LAP support group. So this is what number one on there will tell them to go to the LAP group and we'll get them the contact information for the group facilitator for the group that works best for their schedule. We could be telling them to go to some abstinence based self help groups. So it'll say on there, attend four meetings a week or it'll say attend a daily recovery activity per week. And then we can put some suggested recommendations like the other bar, AA, NA, what we think would be appropriate kind of places for them to start. Um, we'll even put on there, we've got, oh, this probably will come up later. There's um, a group called CHAD, which is a support group for AD, ADHD. And um, some people are really finding that helpful. So even if it's a mental health issue, we might put self-help group meetings on there and have them be depression related meeting or ADHD support. Um, or individual therapy. And that one shows you the quarterly reporting dates. So they have them all on here. They're quarterly year quarters and they have 10 days of a grace period. So they could turn it in at the end of the month or they have until the 10th of the following month after the quarter ends um, to turn in the report from that provider and still be in compliance. Are there a list of approved providers or is that just anyone? Who there is not. That um, will be relevant to a conversation later that we let them choose their own provider. It says an approved provider, so we kind of reserve the right to say this is not an appropriate person. We're really looking to see if it's somebody who is licensed and if they um, are willing to write the reports for us. But um, but if people want to use their insurance, if they don't have insurance, we'll help them find sliding scale or low cost or um, even Potentially, if, if the person needs to, an unlicensed, um, like through a university counseling center or something, if they're training them, but they have supervision, of course, if the person is working under the supervision of a licensed clinician, we can, we can go with that. Have we considered creating a list of sort of non-insurance approved providers so people who are on sliding scale are paying, you know, full pay out of pocket, that there is a list somewhere of like, Either we recommend, you know, instead of mm -hmm. like these people are, you know, good for you, or we these are people who are approved and you can seek out somebody on this list. I'm that's just wondering. A, no, that's a good question uh, because we've had conversation about it. Um, the the way that we divide up the caseload is by area. So the way the CRCs work is they will have a, a group, which in the olden days used to be based on areas. So like there's two San Diego groups and one CRC would be managing the San Diego groups. So they, that person would get to know the resources in the San Diego area and would be able to make referrals, but that's not from a formal list. That's just kind of who they know, who has worked with people and they were good. Um, we still divide it by group, but now because they're all virtual, people are a little more spread out. Um, so we'll rely more on the group facilitators also to help find referrals. This group before the oversight committee has talked about making lists like that of approved providers and decided against it. Those of you who have been here a long time might remember why, but my remember was there were really like liability concerns that if we recommend a person and then there's a problem that that will come back to the LAP. I recall there are bureaucratic issues mm -hmm. with creating this type of a list. And so um, I don't think we made a decision on it, but I think it was raised and then you know, the liability issues and the bureaucratic issues were kind of like, okay, well, we'll on to the next. Yeah. Because it seems so, like to me, there's a difference between recommendation and approved and approved. Mm -hmm. You can have a disclaimer saying like, we're not saying that these people are perfect, mm -hmm. but you have an option to choose from this list of providers that have worked with people before. Can I guess we, uh, you could title it like available providers. Available yeah. okay. Could we uh, maybe ask maybe an opinion or like kind of what would be required to create such a list yeah. of approved providers and then see if other uh, presented to us at the next meeting maybe yeah. and then um, that's a great idea figure out yeah. how we want to proceed um yeah so informally like the the crcs have shared information about providers in different areas and so we if we need to help if we need to send somebody referrals we will send them at least three and then can, you know keep working with them but 
Yeah, or you could have a pre-approved provider list that they don't have to submit a name and credentials because these people have already been vetted. Right. So somebody they could uh, access. Okay, and so then numbers four and five on there, you see four is abstinence. So basically that's the item on there that will ask somebody to remain abstinent. Five on there is the biological fluid testing, which we talked about. That will say on there um, the type of, they're responsible for the fees. And then it says select type of testing. It'll say on there usually afterwards um, that it's uh, 12 to 36 times per year. So that's the range at which their testing can be. And, you know, we can adjust it. That gives us some leeway if they're we're more concerned and we want to keep a closer eye on somebody to go to the higher end of the range or the lower end of the range, if not. And then um, if they need to participate in the daily call-ins, we could also have it set up so that if we're really not concerned about somebody or if there's somebody with a mental health issue, they don't have to do the daily check-ins. The I don't think I said that part. The way that the, the biological fluid testing works is we contract with a third-party company. They set up an account and they log in every day and it will give them a message that says whether they have to test that day or not. And if it's urine testing, it will tell them what option number. And we've got six option numbers. So the idea is that they won't know when they're going to be tested or what they're tested for. Oral fluid only has the one option, unfortunately, at this point. But we have people who do both. So we can have them set up so they have an account open, but they're not doing the daily call-ins because maybe it was somebody with a mental health concern. We don't think that we need them monitored, but if something comes up and we want them to go on a moment's notice, they'll be all set up and we could say, just go take a test this afternoon or tomorrow, whatever. So people with like mental health or whatever only don't have to log in every day until you basically think there's a concern and then it's like, oh, go log in. Or is it more of like, they still log in every day, but they're probably not gonna be asked to be tested until such time as you have a concern. Yeah, if they're only here for mental health, we might take it off entirely. And we're not concerned about testing, so we don't want to test them at all. Or if there is some reason why we feel like, you know, maybe they something they say something in group about like, you know, they it does come up every once in a while that people with mental health forget that they're not supposed to be drinking if they're here just for mental health and they'll be like, I was at a work party and I had like three glasses of wine, which sends up little, you know, like oh, red so flags they're not for us. supposed to drink either. The mental health. They're not supposed to drink either if they have abstinence okay. on their plan, which okay. often they will. Okay. Um, generally because alcohol is a depressant and okay. because we don't want people with mental health issues also taking a depressant and it's contraindicated with most of the medications that yeah. people would be taking for mental health issues. And they're in groups together with people who are in recovery. So yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. I'm just, I know I'm asking a lot of questions. I'm just trying to like, That's why we're doing this that's because exactly why. yeah. yeah. It's really hard for it's you great. all to make recommendations to the committee when you don't know what the program's doing. So. I wanted to ask a question, too. Uh, two sure. things about groups. One is, what's the cost of the groups that these people pay? Every oh, week? we will talk about that. Okay. <laughs> and, and second it's question is, um, what happens in the group and these facilitated groups and group meetings each week? Not in the, not in the other groups, you know, where they might be have a therapist, but in the group meetings. The lab support yeah. groups. Um, so I'll tell you the preview, the groups are 250 per month that they pay to the clinician who's running the group. Um, we do have a financial assistance program, so that's why this will come up later, because we'll be talking more in detail about financial assistance. Um, what happens in group is the group facilitators most often will either go, oh, and we try and keep the group small, right? So we've got ideally there'd be eight people we are getting so many referrals now so the groups are getting pretty large when it gets to 10 we want to split them and we're getting to most most if not all of our groups being at the 10 11 um numbers so um so that's when we have to start working on opening up more groups and the group facilitators generally will check in with all of the people and um Go around the room and see how everybody's doing or they will ask does anybody have anything in particular that they want to talk about and bring to the group um hopefully because it's a support group right so it's not a therapy group based on a specific topic that the therapist is is quote unquote treating they will develop relationships with each other that they can support each other and they're um checking it you know you said this was happening last week you had this coming up how did it go and they will have conversation 
I know some of the group facilitators have said, you know, they, this person tends to give a movie review every time. And so sometimes they will give them the latitude to talk about what they want to, because that's what that person is comfortable talking about. And hopefully that will grow into other things. Um, the group facilitators sometimes also will have a topic. So today, after everybody is talked, if we have time, let's um, talk about resentment or what the topic is, and then they can talk about, you know, what that brings up for them. Hey, uh, let me interrupt. I'm very sorry. It's Martin. Oh, Martin. I have, a, I have a commitment that I couldn't get out of, so I have to sign off for now, and I will catch up later. Thank you. And for those of you who didn't know, Martin was a group facilitator for a while, so I should yeah. let him answer that question. <laughs> okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Take care. Uh, <laughs> open groups are closed groups. Like, like enrollment wise they're open so we'll have people new people coming in as they enroll for that area okay. all right so that was part Michelle, a yes just as it relates to the groups i think so we had a meeting with some of the group facilitators and this is where we may, mm -hmm. may help to talk about we're, we're going to do support later but this may be a good place to kind of pause for a second and talk about that so as we're exploring truly separating monitoring from support we've talked about with the group facilitators and just more generally as to whether there should be new groups that are for the non-monitoring individuals exclusively and the benefits and detriments to that, as well as whether or not they should be a part of the, the monitoring groups. Mm -hmm. And additionally, whether or not, um, Michelle mentioned you know, the Chad, the ADHD group, whether or not there should be like specialized groups as well. So these are things that um, relate to, I think, monitoring currently, but they may relate to um, some of the discussion later this afternoon too, just to mm -hmm. kind of flag that. So, um, so that was part oh, A, that sorry. was an example. Uh, are the groups, so, so groups are all virtual now, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So are, are they mixed or are they uh, by region or are they, because before everything was in person, yes. you go to the one that's closest by, yes. and people within your, you know, your small legal community. Mm. Whereas like if you're mixing groups from different regions, good for networking but it's also good for well you know the person who may practice in the same area as i do in the same region as i do may be opposing counsel on a case um, is not ending up in my group yes um both we're trying in general we still have a lot of the groups named the san diego groups and the laguna Niguel groups so um so if people are in that area and that time and day works for them we'll guide them that direction but because we have the flexibility now, yeah. we have some groups that are just labeled e-group. And so people who are, I mean, we can even have people who are living out of state now. We have people living out of country coming to the groups um, so they can attend. You, you made oh, I'm just that. thinking like, <laughs> should it be part of our groups because we are a California state bar. Well, there's, but they're licensed. Like, there's still California state. attorneys, yeah, yeah, who have moved. Yeah. It's just not some. Random person. No, no, they're not random, yeah, but they're still, <laughs> still California. Yeah, which is basically your right, episode. Yeah. 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 When you get, sure. when you get to like eight to 10, like 10 people in a group, 11 people, do you take two people out of that group or do you just leave that group at 11 and restart and start a new group? We've done both. Recently we did just have a group facilitator open up a brand new group and start to grow it from scratch which is risky because what if nobody comes and then they're reserving their time and they're not getting paid for it. But, but it, it worked in this case, it's growing. And then other times um, they will split the group. So they'll, the group facilitator will talk about it. And the, you know, it's not one week notice, they'll lead up to this and they'll talk about finding another time that will work for the rest of the group and then splitting them and making two groups out of it. I also want to just do a quick time check. It's 12.15. It's lunchtime. I tend to get hangry. I don't know if this is a good place to stop or if you want to finish this lunch is, slide. Lunch is here. We were thinking there's one more slide that maybe relates to what Michelle's talking about, and then we can pause it. Like the co we're going to start talking about costs later. Yeah, so maybe if we can get through, that'd be good. we'll finish the monitoring plan because this is fast. Parts B and C. Okay. Part B. I, I don't know that I even fully finished your question, but. We'll talk about it later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> part, part B is something for that participant to do, pay attention, there's due dates, but it's the same for everyone in the program. It's not personalized like part A is for that individual. 
So that's their quarterly reports and their um, LAP continuing education. This is not MCLE. This is continuing education related to the substance use or mental health issue that brought them to the program. Um, you know, if you all have more questions about those later, we can certainly talk about them. But just to get through to Part C, um, Part C is general stuff. So it's not something for them to do necessarily, no timelines, but it's the general information, maintaining anonymity and confidentiality of the other people they meet in the lab groups. I edited down there to go one, two, and then nine, just to get some of the highlights here. It's really like, to let it make sure you've updated your, your contact information with us, return phone calls. Um, and then underneath that is where the signature lines are. So they sign it and the CRC will sign it. It's, I don't have a slide of the signature lines, but that's what comes at the bottom. That's a good stopping point after the monitoring plan. Okay. Sounds good. So for those on Zoom, when do you want to return just so they know when to come back? Well, since we're one o'clock, good. Or do we want to have a shorter lunch? Push through. Yeah. So like maybe 1245? Give us about. Okay. okay. That's fine with me. Or we can do it working. Whatever. Let's do should a break. I just, should, we, should I log off and log back on? Or? Uh, it's up, Tracy, it's up to you. So you can either log log off and log back on at 1245. If not, um, we can, um, you can either mute, mute and turn off your own video or we could do that for you, whatever your okay, preference. I'll just mute and turn off the video. Thank you. Okay. 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 Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so hey, you, you don't have stop to stop the recording. I do. Yeah. <laughs> you can stop the recording. Um, and then if you want to mute the room, I know. I assume it's out here somewhere. Yes. Yes, it should be here. So you mentioned Scott. I haven't thought about Scott for a long time. Can I see it? Right up. Our recording has resumed. Okay. We're back from lunch. Um, I think we're still on item D1, no review and discussion on monitoring. And Michelle is going to continue the presentation. So we. We stopped after looking at the monitoring plan. Um, the next slide talks about the cost of all this. Um, then after that goes back into like some reporting and forms. So, um, so just to let you know this, we're talking about cost. This is probably going to be <laughs> marking lots of ideas and things to talk about, but we will also have time later when we're talking about cost of the program overall that we can Talk about that too. And this is like one of those <clears throat> bigger picture policy issues that we're looking for the plan for the planning side of things. So this is just some background first before yeah. we get there. This will help set the stage. So first off, all of the stuff, of course, that's covered by staff. There's no cost for the participant. So um, there are some cases in the world where people would have to pay for monitoring. The attorneys don't need to pay for that. None of the monitoring and reporting and clinical staff, anything done by state bar staff, no cost. The lab group, 250 per month, um, as I mentioned, goes to the group facilitator. Um, and by the way, it is important to mention that none of that goes to the participant because there was a time in the past where we did charge administrative fees, and I think we are still authorized in the statute. That part hasn't been changed yet, that we can charge an administrative fee if needed, but we don't now. Um, okay, so the testing, is big range right there, 80 to 275 a month. And the reason it's such a big range is because um, it depends on the type of test that somebody is doing and the frequency of the testing. So at the lowest end, you'd have somebody who's testing once a month and they're doing just the one um, either oral fluid or urine test. And they're similar costs, but it's broken down differently. Uh, between the oral fluid and the urine test. So with one, you have to buy the kits and collection, and one of them you go to the place, so it costs less upfront, but then the collection sites will charge their own fees. And so we don't really have a way of knowing how much the collection site is gonna charge for their fee, but it's generally gonna be about um, 40 to $50. So low end, you'd be paying 80 a month for testing if you're on testing. Higher end, if you're testing more frequently, so three times a month or um, 
or if we need to do another type of test like we I, I did not talk about earlier, there is a blood test that we can do. We don't generally do that. It's not like a common thing that people are on their cycle of testing, but, um, but it's called a PETH test and it can detect binge alcohol usage. So not necessarily one drink, but, but several drinks going back um, up to three weeks. So if there's somebody who's missing tests, for example, and they want to verify for the past three weeks, that really, even though I missed a test, I was still sober, they can elect to take PET tests and the PET test is gonna be really expensive. And so that also would push up the cost. Then there's the other recommendations we make and it's, you know, they all have costs. So if we recommend that somebody needs um, an inpatient treatment program, that's gonna be expensive, but that's gonna vary based on the kind of treatment program, if they have insurance to cover it, if they wanna spend $50,000 a month at a private facility or if they wanna to go to Salvation Army. Um, so, both are good it, options. Yes. <laughs> oh, we, I, I will always remember I had a participant who went to Salvation Army and he just got such good care and he got really solid sobriety from it after other failed treatment attempts. And it was, um, it was really great for him and, and no cost, but not cushy. No. Like some of you go to Malibu Treatment Center and have a very nice spa experience and can get sober there potentially, but <laughs> it's a different experience. How often are you finding that people need that level of care? Not extremely often. Um, it's a need is the word that I'm questioning right now. So need is more subjective. If there is somebody who we think needs treatment and I think we were talking a little bit, some of us earlier, about like the types of attorneys that we get in the program are mostly sole practitioners and they have no safety net and they don't have staff. And somebody in that position is going to generally give us a lot more pushback about going to treatment and say, I don't need a residential and I can do it other ways. And so even if we think we would recommend it in, in the situation of somebody who had more um, options or more like free time that they could use, vacation time, that for that person, we might say inpatient, if we think it would still be reasonable, not potentially like dangerous for this person to not go inpatient, we might give them the option of showing us first that they could stay sober in an intensive outpatient program where at least they're getting like nine hours of treatment a week, but they're living at home and they're still able to do their work. So more often, we don't have people as often going to inpatient. We have more often intensive outpatient programs, um, or the like other option the individual is sober um, living ever an option we're sober living yeah okay. yeah we definitely have people in sober livings often after one of those other treatment experiences and are there ever any times when you have a recommendation that this person do x y or z and because of finances they can't do what is recommended yes and we, we will really try and avoid that we will try and work with them to figure out what we can. Um, but that's why we have the financial assistance program. And then that's why we're having this discussion later about program costs, because that is something that we need to spend more time thinking about. Um, right, and so like I was saying, depending on what the other recommendations we make, depending if they could use their insurance, they will make the, the costs of the program vary for people. All right, so let's go to the next slide. So these are more forms. This is a participation report form. So when we're talking about sending reports to the court, this is what we're talking about. So when we say somebody is in monitoring, they sign a release of information for the alternative discipline program, a report is gonna to go to the state bar court and office of chief trial counsel, this is the report. It is not a pages long narrative. It is their name and bar number, when they signed the documents. Are they in compliance? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, that's basically it. Um, there's no comment there. If the answer is no, it will say what item on their monitoring plan they're not in compliance with. So it would say, what was our example? Like part, part A, number one, unexcused mislap group on X date. Um, no, 
but the person called ahead of time and then they said this or they forgot to call or they did none of that like narrative stuff. It's just were they in compliance with the monitoring plan um, and if not, why? Um, and the drug testing here, I don't know why I just included that it's not required to test for this case or it might say um, no unauthorized substances detected. So that's also very brief. It will just say if they're in compliance or not and if there's any substances detected. Now, um, next slide, please. Most likely, if there are substances detected, the court will already know about it because this is the immediate report of non-compliance form. So this is the form that we will send if somebody does one of these things on the check boxes, if they've withdrawn when you know they're supposed to be here because somebody has re required them to be, if they leave treatment against advice, that one is generally not something that we pay attention to, but I mean, that we have to deal with because they um, most often do not leave treatment against advice. Um, but an unexcused missed lab test, a lab test that detects substances, or an unexcused missed group or therapy session are things that we will let the court um, or the Office of Probation know about immediately. And by immediate, that's within five business days of us finding out about whatever the issue was. So in the case that I was talking about, we would have sent an immediate report of noncompliance for a missed check off the missed um, unexcused absence from lab group with the date. And then on the next regular report, which was the previous slide, it would say the same thing, part A, number one, the unexcused missed group, as previously reported on this immediate report of noncompliance. So hopefully that also clarifies some of like the mystery about what the other offices in the state bar find out about participation is where it's it's really minimal it's a, and it's about compliance not about our opinions or any narrative All right any questions about those reports reports go to whom um well it depends why they're here it will go <laughs> if they're here for the alternative discipline program it will go to the court um so whichever um, judge's courtroom they're in to the staff member in the Office of Chief Trial Counsel who's handling their matter and to them, the participant. And if it's um, probation, it will go to the probation staff. We, the Office of Admissions has not asked us to send immediate reports. They actually want even less information than what we send to the court because they're very, um, very, very cautious about their rules that they have to follow about not making their decisions based on mental health issues. So um, we give them even less information than this. Okay, so if, a, if you have a voluntary person, there is, is there any non-compliance in a voluntary person? Well, they could be out of compliance, but there's no one to report it to. So we would just talk to them about it and handle it clinically to figure out what's going on with them that they're unable to be in compliance with it. But, um, but in that case, there's no one. Who would this report it. go to then? So we would No, we wouldn't write a report if we're not reporting to anybody. All right, thanks. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> so the one-year certificate is um, another form. This one, I believe, was developed because um, for the alternative discipline program because they want to know after a participant has met these criteria of being sober or with mental health stability um, for at least one year. So. It is really just the form on our letterhead with these sentences that the LAP certifies that that person has satisfied all the lab testing requirements, or it won't say the lab testing requirements, set forth in the monitoring plan for one year prior to the date. During this time, no unauthorized substances were detected, or it will say that next bullet point during the time that person has maintained mental health stability and has participated successfully in the LAP. That's for the case of somebody being in the program for mental health reasons. We can do both if they want both, and um, and it's not about compliance. It's about sobriety or mental health stability. So somebody can be out of compliance with the monitoring plan and still earn this. Now, not out of compliance in the sense that they were having dirty tests and things like that, but in the sense of, you know, reports were turned in late or something that doesn't affect this. Um, and so most often we are requested to write these when somebody is nearing the end of their time in the alternative discipline program and the court wants this to be able to move them on to the next phase. How do you determine someone has mental health stability? That is um, 
difficult. I mean, it's really going through to make sure that they're doing their therapy appointments, that when we've got the quarterly reports, that they're working on the goals, that there hasn't been any mental health crisis, like any suicidal thinking or any you know time that they've just dropped off the radar, um, you know, what the group facilitator has seen over the past year. Right, because sobriety is very, mm -hmm. you know, qualitative, quantitative, mm -hmm. but um, <laughs> mental health stability is very qualitative. It's like, yeah. You know, it's very subjective. So that's why I was, I just, you know, was trying to figure out how we determine that. Yeah, it's a lot more difficult than just seeing if somebody had had a positive test for a substance or admitted to yeah. using. All right, next slide. All right, then there's graduation. graduation. Um, in our paperwork formally, it's called successful completion. So some people call it graduation. If you see it, those are interchangeable graduation or successful completion from lab. Um, this is separate from the one year certificate, separate from the other things. The criteria that are set for successful completion are a minimum of three years of continuous sobriety or mental health stability, satisfying the terms of the monitoring plan and lifestyle changes to support the ongoing recovery and stability. So the graduation process involves the person um, making a request, you know, they send an email, we're ready to graduate. We have a form that, that, that gives them like some talking points to write a report about what's happened now, what's, what their life is like different now from before they came into lab, what their recovery program looks like, what their relapse prevention plan looks like, what, how they plan to maintain their sobriety or stability after lab participation and they will write this um, no more than five pages. So it'll be, you know, two, three, five pages and um, talk about it in their lap groups, get feedback from the other people in the groups who they've gotten to know over the past years and the group facilitator. And then we have, we'll have a clinical review team meeting and it's the team that officially decides if somebody has completed or not completed lap. So this is where the idea comes from that lap is a three-year program. It's not actually a three-year program. As we've talked about, there's people who have been here a very long time. You can participate as long as you want to, as long as supportive for you, you could drop out whenever you want to, if you don't need the service anymore. But if you want to be designated to officially have graduated or successfully completed LAP, then it's a minimum of three years. Um, obviously, if somebody has been participating for two years and they have a relapse, then they go the next three years, so they'll be in LAP for five years. Um, the reason if you see, if there's, um, was it graduates in the annual report? I don't know that we specifically pull out the number of graduates, but the number of graduates from LAP is very low because most people do not need to go through this whole process. They get what they need to, and then they leave. The only people who really do this are those who are required to, in order to satisfy usually their probation requirements. So they'll go through the alternative discipline program after they're like officially finished with ADP, the order will usually include that they need to be followed by the office of probation. And one of the conditions of probation is to successfully complete lap. So that, those are really the only cases. I mean, we'll have a couple of graduates a year. I'll have this out there. Do we even need to have something like this? If the probation order is already going to say you just need to continue doing that for another two, three years and be in compliance for those who don't like, is this like, and maybe just throw it out there. Is this like I, a necessary? Yes. Um, I would like I'm Melanie sorry. here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cause I don't know how this plays with, there's probably a very good reason why it's three yeah. years. Um, and it may not be based on any kind of like recovery based or diagnosis based reason because it's just a number. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, maybe we can get Yeah, that. and I, that- I was gonna have a non-Melanie needed question, I think. So, oh. and that was, um, does it, do you ever get to this stage and does the clinical review team ever determine that they are not, have not successfully completed at this point? If they've already gone through all of these can't think of a case like okay, that. that's so it's almost I don't I don't want to call it a rubber stamp because I'm assuming that it's carefully reviewed and all of that, but it's like if you've already done all of this, you are likely to be 
considered to have successfully completed by the clinical review team. Yes. Okay. Because it's unlikely that somebody would request to graduate if they haven't done these things. And then if they have, they, they've met the criteria. And so we're, we're mostly having a, like, just kind of, yeah, just like a recap. This is how it went and really great job. We're proud of you. Are you interested in helping out Lita with presentations? If she needs graduates to come with her to a presentation and like having a kind of wrap up. Do you up? ever come up with a, like a, like when you do discharge planning for someone, you usually have like, here's the plan going forward. Like, because you're out on your own now, like here's what we recommend. Do you do any of that? Like continue going to AA meetings or like, no, we don't um, have something that we're telling them, like, this is what you should do, but that's the type of the stuff they're writing in the report. They're writing, this is what I'm going to do. Okay. And we haven't had a case where somebody is writing, I'm done with all this. And I'm never <laughs> going to do it again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I okay. will say, though, Justin, your question is well timed because this, that, this is really the other big policy yeah. issue that we want this group's help with is, is what it, where did the three years come from? Like, and is that based on best practices now? It kind of dovetails with the cost issue too, to, you know, and, and there's a lot of factors as you're pointing out. So that's exactly some, we'll talk about, yeah. I think we need a little subcommittee to, to, to dive in for the year. It's not something we're gonna resolve today, but, but it's a big issue. And Melanie's, ex I, I will get to, but Melanie's experience um, before working with us was in the Office of Chief, Tri Chief Trial Council. So she knows a lot more about the court processes and, and we'll be a liaison when we're talking to the courts also about what they need from us if they, if they need a certificate. Yeah. And I'll be, I used to work in the state bar court and um, one of the concerns that was, it, the cost of the program was raised as a concern actually by the state bar court to a certain extent, because there is an ask as it relates to um, the terms of probation for the individual mm -hmm. to successfully complete. Successful completion as currently defined is three years and we, this is all tied together. Mm -hmm. So, and then we just looked at the costs and they can be very high, especially for an attorney who may be out of work based on the discipline yep. that's ordered by the Supreme Court and so forth. So I think these things, yes, I think they are certainly th things that need to be separately considered, but they, I think they do play together to a certain mm -hmm. extent as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did the time used to be five years? Wasn't it five and then it was, it was five three? Um, at some point when I started. Originally yeah. I thought it was five years because <clears throat> because that was usually the standard for uh, the ideal of in, uh, stability and sobriety. Yeah. If you got five years sober, you're probably going to stay sober. Mm -hmm. so in 20 years and go out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, and that was changed not long after I started working here. So it must have been in like 2007 or eight. Yeah, quite a while ago. Um, it was a long time ago. And, and I... And I think that was concern at the time was that the, the state board course said this is a really long time. So they moved it to three. And since none of the people who made that decision are here now, I don't know why they chose three. Um, it just seems like an additional probationary term yeah. that they could just explicitly put in the probation order and just say, continue for three years or continue yeah. for four or whatever, whatever recommendation. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm coming up with alternatives. Um, this is, and you this probably is can good. tell already how I feel about three years. <laughs> but what I will say, <laughs> not to speak for, because Melanie will address this from her perspective from Chief Trial Counsel, but um, when the court currently, under the current model, when the State Bar Court is making recommendations regarding probation conditions, that is before, for the most part, individuals have participated in the orientation and assessment in lap. So for a judge to have, like, so our system, it's not bifurcated in a sense. We're like, for, for, um, individuals who go through the criminal court process, you are sentenced or you are found culpable or not culpable and then you're sentenced. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's typically an evaluation period that occurs where they, um, yeah. where that's a part of it, right? Is they're looking at a bunch of different things, including, you know, sentencing guidelines and so forth. But when they're recommending either probation and what probation may look like or stuff, they have a lot more information than what the state bar court judges have when they're making their recommendations. So that could be a downside of just telling the state bar court to, instead of saying successfully complete, to say, uh, like the state bar court judge is going to recommend, you know, two years of pro two years of to graduate from lap or ten years to graduate from lap because they won't have that information and to go through the process of getting that changed. So in you can go to the state bar court and seek a probation modification, but you know that's a process. You have to. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, 
it's a it's a court related process. So, you know, depending on the individual, like everyone is attorneys, so they may have the ability to do that, but they may not. And then if you don't have the ability to do that and you're hiring an attorney to do that on your behalf, there's obviously a cost associated with that. So um, a factor so, to consider yeah, yeah, in no, all I, of this. <laughs> I guess my thought is like, why are we doing the probation like terms the same day as we're doing the findings? What if it's a if it's a substance abuse or mental health related issue? Why not pend it for ninety days till the lap program? You know, if it's recommended that this person goes to lap, pend it for ninety days and say we'll come back. You know, and then they can put in their successful completion of the lap program, which sure. you can define according to this graduation parameters. So, and with Melanie not here for the moment, I don't know if you want to speak to ASAR, because that's kind of what is being explored, which is a probation redesign project, which would allow for the um, probation case specialists who work with the individual who is subject to discipline to have more discretion in. So theoretically, the probation condition could say the probation case specialist is going to recommend, like you need to go to participate in LAP, but the parameters in which you participate in LAP will be evaluated by the probation case specialist or LAP itself. And so it's not going to be the judge right. with less information making this determination. It's going to be done once the probation case specialist has more information. So that's something that that's being sense. considered. Yeah, but the, you raise a really good point, Andrew, yeah. and this is exactly why it, it feels like in the weeds, but this has been such a great conversation because it really is <laughs> helping everyone know where we are and then your input is really helpful in these questions. I'm just taking notes on things that, you know, we can plan for, but to answer, to go in a little more detail about it, we call it ASAR, it's Attorney Assistance and Redesign Program. And we're in the middle of this is a re, kind of a redesign of the probation in general. Think using um, techniques that have been used outside of the professional licensing world, but, you know, like with the kind of based off out of the um, like juvenile justice reform, this type of concept of trying to understand a little bit more about each respondent, what their issues might be, what, what might be causing them to recidivate, if that's an issue, and identifying some of those, and then having more um, customized supervision strategies for each person instead of just more, you know, from a court level, they'd just be like, this was your offense, so here's what your probation's going to be, go, and now we're trying to be much more thoughtful about each individual. So what you're suggesting and we're still developing that out right now, so maybe this can be an overlap, you know, as we're as we're working on like the, the next part of that, the next phase of that program right now is like a needs assessment uh, that we're designing. Yeah. So the probation case specialist would kind of go through a list of questions and kind of understand where they are, and that will help us kind of from, from a more um, subjective standpoint figure right. out what they need. So that's good. Good. I'm gonna make According to BNP section 6231, subsection 1 slash C, that's where the five year minimum came. I just looked from the statute. Okay. Oh. And there, there is some value in giving people a goal. Right here. You know, yeah. Goal. And, uh, and sometimes employers or partners or others want to uh, want to know that this, this program has been quote unquote completed. <laughs> and so, in order to move on. And so if you, if you don't, I mean, if you have a nebulous undefined completion date, then it's kind of difficult. So I have a bit of a hypothetical question, given that there's people don't really get turned down from graduating, but is there an appeals process if they do get turned down? Is there an appeals process if they do get turned down? No, we do not have anything set up. Good question. I think the same thing would apply if you're chosen not to participate in lab and you know that somebody should appeal it and say like you know if they so that that in a theory that exists currently okay. in the in the ability to seek to modify your probation but that's mm -hmm. exactly what we just talked about mm -hmm. so um theoretically that <clears throat> could be done so someone could get the pro proposed probation conditions the probation conditions could be um you know approved by the so, for the most part, the state bar court only recommends discipline. It does not order discipline. That mm -hmm. discipline is typically ordered by the California Supreme Court. There are limited areas, like a reproval, for example, a public reproval is considered discipline, and that is something the state bar court can order without right. Supreme Court approval. So, for the most part, in either scenario, 
let's say that the probation conditions that are either proposed and ultimately approved by the California Supreme Court or ordered by the State Bar Court include successfully complete LEP. Mm -hmm. So that would be something that under the current system, somebody could theoretically seek to modify the terms of their probation. And to do so, they could do that. So they would file it, they would seek to file a case that would modify their probation. It's not under the current model, an expedited process. So if you're seeking to modify your probation, it's gonna go through the same time frame that like a typical discipline case would likely go through to a certain extent. And so there's there's an argument to be made that you are not in compliance while that's pending, which is, this is kind of broader than I think where we wanna maybe talk today. Well, but I think the question was <laughs> yeah. actually more narrow than that. Okay, okay sorry. <laughs> Let's go back to it. Like when we talked about the intake process, and the assessment and evaluation. And if you find someone is not really appropriate for that, is there an appeal process that someone can do to like appeal higher up and say, or appeal to you and say like, I really wish you would reconsider me for the LAP program and here's why. Um, so the way the LAP structure is right now, it's the, the clinical team, clinical review team, that's like, at the top, so there isn't like any appeals above that. Um, we, if some, so the way we as staff see the program is that it's a voluntary program. People can choose to be here. I know not everyone in the world sees it that way because they are being told to come to us from somebody else, but we're not the ones making us come. So we're gonna err on the side of admitting people. If they are coming to us for help, we're gonna err on the side of admitting them to the program even if the diagnosis is an adjustment disorder because of stress and things related to their state bar process. Like if they, if they want in, I can't think of like a time where we wouldn't let somebody oh. in. It's usually the other way around is that they don't want us to admit them. And we're saying there's a problem. They're like, no, they're not. Tell them there's no problem with me and don't admit me. So, yeah. So Lita, are we not in compliance with that? PNP section. Then? Oh, I didn't. I didn't say that. I was just. No, saying, I was just asking. Somebody asked a question like, "Where did the three years or five yeah. years come from?" And so I. Pulled no, up no, that no. BNP I was section. just wondering, like, does that mean if it's in the the BMP that we? Wait, sorry. To... What section? I missed where you, what number you said it was again. Business and Professions Code sixty two thirty one, section one, subsection C is in Charles. Okay, um, so that, the that has to do with the, like members. the members of this. Yeah, committee. that's the members of this committee. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, oh, sorry. So, yeah. So, and that's still, that still kind of points to the same question, though, is mm -hmm. where did that five right, come yeah. from? Like, why, why are people looking at five? So, when they made up this committee, they wanted a member of the other bar. And I'm pointing that way because <laughs> Jim is now our representative. <laughs> so, they, they want a member of the other bar on this committee, and that person. They want to be sober for five years at least. So mm -hmm. where like well, it's actually the program that's in continuous operation for the past five years. I think not that well, and well then there's yeah. a D now okay, which does it. have that for the, the five, five years. years. Yeah. But it's um but that the statute hasn't been amended since twenty eleven. So you know it could still be a holdover mm -hmm. from prior policy. I just think that's a really important thing to check. <laughs> no, yeah. no, so it's, right. not, it's not. It's not. It's not in the statute. It's, oh, it's requiring yes. individuals to be in the program for five years to successfully uh -huh. complete. That's not in the statute. Okay. All right. So, then the next slide is actually the lead up to the discussion and and, and what do we want to do here? Mm -hmm. um, some of the suggestions of what the oversight committee can do in 2023 um, are suggested here. And then we've got a whole other um, item on the agenda to discuss that type of thing. So, well, I think we can just kind of to talk it. about it now. I yeah. mean, I think you, so our, our goal here was to have, which thank you, Michelle, that was so great and helpful to me too, because you know, you just, I, I knew it kind of, but it's really nice to hear that comprehensive view and hear all of your questions too, just to make, think about it. So um, the two big ones that based on, as Michelle was saying, um, we've heard from conversations with State Bar Court, some concerns about costs. So to me, I think from an oversight standpoint and an expertise standpoint from this group, to have maybe, I think Justin, you were suggesting, and I like this idea, maybe two people 
to be on a subcommittee that could help direct staff and maybe we could even think about do we engage like a consultant or something to help us really research this issue of cost you know what um, cost to participants what does it cost in other places how might we like improve our financial assistance program to help are there other things that we can do you know that kind of thing but guiding to make sure that cost is not prohibiting people from going through and getting the help that they need um, so that's one big area. And then the other area, as we said, it kind of relates, but having to do with this, um, and maybe we don't need to, I was thinking, sorry, I was mixing this up. I think the consultant would be most helpful in the su successful completion discussion. Um, you know, someone that could help us know what, what other states do, how, or other programs, even if it's not a state, a lap per se, but be it a medical, medical board program, or um, even just outside of the, professional context, you know, what, how would you define successful completion? Has, has the thinking on that changed since we've, or, and, and maybe this even reduction to three years wasn't really based on research, but just kind of a compromise situation. It's not the way you're describing it. It could be that. So how can we get some more data and make sure that where we're setting this successful completion, it makes sense to people. Um, yeah. Going to the first question on financial assistance, and apologies if you already talked about this, but do we have an idea of how many people like seek financial assistance versus um for versus how many we give it to? Twenty like, twenty years. Or not even not even not even versus who we that would be helpful, but I think in general, big picture, like how many total population total out of the population seek? Is it twenty a year? Uh, Jennifer actually Yeah, she 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 would know so, the data, yeah. Yeah. Maybe fifteen. It went up with the pandemic, definitely. So those are that's how many seek it. And then, 10%. and then how many? Most of them get it. Get it. Okay. The, the main reason story. they don't get it is because they make too much money. And it also, yeah, having looked at that, I mean, I think inflation. Yeah, is the threshold um, and I don't for remember when these, when these yes. rules were put in place. It might be useful to like look at the income limits. I think one limit's forty thousand dollars for two people, or it doesn't even say. It's 40 for two. It doesn't say anything about one. So we've just been using 40,000 for one. Okay. So like essentially you have to be out of a job to be a, a plot uh, eligible. Right. Um, and then again, that seems unreasonable for level setting, perhaps for my benefit, but maybe for Dr. Yenny's too, as far as, um, you know, how, once, once you are participating in the program, I know we don't like we don't send anyone to collections or anything like that if they're not paying it back. But as far as the recouping those costs, it's low. I don't know how we, that was another yeah, thing. I, I talked to you about it this. yesterday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the <laughs> the network recoup costs is my understanding, but just to make sure that we're all on the same page in this discussion. Yeah. There are people who pay back the loan, but it's more of a happy surprise than the expected you know, what we've seen from people. So have we actually forgiven those loans or have we just said, uh, nah, they're out there. They're just out there and we don't, you know, we're not a collection agency and we don't any don't longer have it. a contract with the collection agency. So we don't report it. So it like wouldn't affect someone's credit score. No, no one else would know about it besides us. We had a billing agency and a collections agency, but someone from another department canceled it and said that our finance department would take care of it. But our finance department said they couldn't take care of it. So there, there's. There's also another section to this. The law students that I talked to, they don't want to use this program because they can't afford it. They're already looking at 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 in student loan debt. And they're like, I need help, but there's no way. And I explained to them that there's a financial assistance program. They're like, I don't want to add more to my, my loan mm -hmm. debt. Right. And so I'm not going to use the program. That was my question yeah. about scholarships. Do we have, mm -hmm. do we offer any? And well, that's what I would love for a working group to talk about mm -hmm. in 23 is if we could either add or just change the loan program entirely to a grant or scholarship type of program. Um, that would be great if this committee could could just, I mean, the whole thing could use reworking, I would think. Well, you so know, originally they, uh, it was written so that no person would be turned away. Right. <clears throat> so I think the law schools are being turned away. Law students are being turned away now. Uh, they're not even asking well, because yeah. Yeah. previously we didn't offer them to the law students until there was a change in the rules. Right. So, well, originally, yeah. originally when we tried to get this moved along, uh, the state bar balked at the idea of loaning people money. We originally loaned them money, and 
things like that, but it got to be a lot of money going out yeah. and nothing coming back. <laughs> <clears throat> so that kind of changed a little bit and we got a little bit tighter on the first string. But, but I do think that if we go back to the original intent that Senator Burton had when he put this into the Senate, um, we'd go back to grants or something like that, you know, and spend our money in a helpful way or accessible on those so people that we think are going to benefit. What pot of money is the financial assistance coming from right now? That's a good question. Um, so LAP is funded through um, the attorney licensing fees from a special, um, what's it called? Restricted fund. Restricted fund, but the, I forget what the assessment is called. Well, the licensing fees? The, it's it's one of the, like, it's like there's a, a separate line that has the amount yeah. for, of, in addition to like the licensing fee, parts that goes into the general fund, there's the part that goes into the LAP fund which is $10 for each licensed attorney, or sorry, active attorney, and $5 for each inactive attorney. Um, so that's the money to fund the program, the staff salaries and, and everything, minus $1 of that $10, which goes to the other bar. Um, so that's the answer. That's where that money comes from, is all, the, the operation. Sorry. Say that again. Do you want to take that? The other bar. Other bar is a group of lawyers and judges that help other lawyers and judges and law students uh, and their families, if necessary, with chemical dependency and or mental health issues. It used to be only chemical dependency. Started out with alcoholism through the uh, evolution of things. And the, the other bar actually was one of the first in the country to start helping other lawyers. And then it kind of spread out through the country. Uh, California, there was a group in Los Angeles, a group in San Francisco, they got together. There was a group in New York <clears throat> that started something, one group in Montreal, Canada, and uh, they all got together and formed the International Lawyers in AA, uh, which influenced the American Bar Association. All these guys were members of the American Bar Association, so they influenced the American Bar Association to study, uh, what was it, attorney? I forget what the word was. It was offensive, whatever it was, deficiencies or something. Like that. <laughs> and so, uh, which had to do with alcoholism. So they started studying alcoholism and that developed into other things that developed into the ideal of lawyer assistance programs throughout the country. And then all of them started to develop their own lawyer assistance programs or lawyers helping lawyers or something like that until California came on board as one of the last states, even though we were one of the first states to bring it up, we were the last state to get in on it. And so that's where the other bar starts. And so now we have, with the other bar, we have about 30 meetings a week throughout the state. I still can't get that list. I emailed it. Keep your hands up our list. What are you talking about? <laughs> the, the, the meetings. Oh, just the meetings? Yeah. Okay. I uh, signed up on the website, the other bar. and Just email me now. I'll email you. Yeah. Okay. And so... <laughs> Most of them are now remote, and I wanted to report to you, because we're going to talk about law students, uh, that the other bar now has started uh, outreach into law schools, and we have an active meeting, remote meeting, that involves at least four large law schools, and moving into several others, including Western State, and just last week expressed an interest to make it available. So. And this is a remote meeting, so everybody can join, and it's it's a good thing. And they, we've asked them to have a group conscience as to whether people other than law students can join, so whether they want active lawyers, judges, anything else. And so they have to make their own group conscience about that. Um, this may be jumping forward a little bit, but I think it kind of goes to this. Um, the last couple of things we talked about in terms of the law students and the the voluntary side of the support services side. Now, I guess my first question is, do they have to pay for that? And my second question is, if they're participating in the support services side, um, is it also three years? Like, I'm trying to understand how, like, the okay. two, if there's an overlap or, or are we better, like, fielding them the other direction and not really discussing them on the monitoring side? That's why I think this split helps make things more clear for people. So the monitoring is going to have all the same monitoring rules for everybody now. So if, if a student wanted to be monitored, we'll do it. If a student wants to successfully complete, it would be those same completion rules. 
Um, but nobody, we don't require anybody to complain, so they can withdraw when they want to. The support services side will be all different stuff. So right now it's still the two free counseling sessions, so that's no, no fee for that. And the career counseling sessions, no fee for that. And TBD, so we can talk about what else is, is developed there. But so far there's nothing on that side that would charge a fee, but, um, but it's possible that we would develop a program on that side that has a cost to it also. I mean, I guess to me, it just seems to make more sense for law students, aside from those maybe with moral character issues, to be actually funneled into the support services side where we can create something that's more targeted um, for both law students and attorneys who aren't in need of monitoring mm -hmm. rather than trying to fit them into the monitoring side and have them pay for that if they need to or, you know, unless there's some reason they need to be monitored, I feel like the bulk of them yes. should be funneled into the other side. That is exactly like on target. Like that's yes. exactly why we're doing this because in the past, and when, you know, when I had the slide there about the numbers, we had been tasked with a metric at one point of increasing black enrollment. So like around 2018, Lita starts, we're doing this outreach, we're increasing our enrollment. But when you take a step back and think about it, like what, why do we want to increase the number of people who need monitoring? There's, this is a very, um, like we were talking about levels of care, people need, yeah. you know, a, a small level or they need like a small level of support or they need to go to an inpatient treatment program we don't need everybody going to the this full treatment program so let's develop other things that the people who are here who only need a little bit people who need medium people who aren't sure can have other services and things available so we're not just shoving everybody into this intensive monitoring program okay. so that's yeah that's exactly why we're doing this is because we want to have that Another, we talked with the group facilitators as it related to, to this issue with law students. And I will say that I thought it was mixed results and Michelle, let me know if you disagree, but we talked about like whether or not there should be a law students only group as opposed mm -hmm. to a, um, like a mixed group of yeah. attorneys and law students. And it's my perception, my perspective of what the group facilitators said is that the law students really enjoy being, they get a lot out of being in yeah. group with the attorneys. Mm. And so my only thought i think these are two separate things but if we go down that path of just having law students only engage in support services and let's say that an aspect of that does not include group i just think that's something we want to consider because or if it's going to involve separate groups for the truly um support services only groups individuals i wonder if that's something we want to consider because they did seem to get a lot of benefit and there will be support services only attorneys too so that doesn't mean right. it's just going to be law students by themselves no no, no I that's something that. to think yeah. about because yeah. the, the group facilitators did i think indicate that the law students really got a lot of value out of participating and it in makes sense attorneys. so that i mean i wouldn't be opposed to doing it on the support side too i just think that we're trying to maybe push them in the wrong direction sure that's all yeah so our goal will be more towards growing the support services side and maintaining the service that we have for people who need monitoring, but not doing the outreach with the intention of increasing the numbers on the monitoring side. Mm -hmm. okay. So I don't want a blunt discussion because we're having lots of really good discussions, but I'm going to say next probably will. Um, <laughs> but um, I think what our task is right now is I think we're trying to find volunteers to maybe work on some of these different, um, well, particularly um, work on the financial assistance and then work on the, uh, or on the cost issue and then work on, um, I'm not gonna cost a working group for successful completion. Um, and then, you know, we could kind of go from there. And then throughout the year, I think we'll create a plan on, you know, what we'll maybe present to the, to this committee at the end of the year to maybe either I either adopt or present as a recommendation to the board. Is that kind of what that right. like? Probably it would result in some possible changes yeah. and then it could go that way or we can. Yes, yeah. it would it would eventually go to the board, I think. But but it just depends on okay. what the changes end up being. So what I think we need to do. Then we Let's... could combine into one working group unless you all think that that is too big of a task. Um, benchmarks to measure successful participation. Because when we're talking about, you know, we're asked how many people graduate from lab as if that will show how many people are successful in lab. And as we talked about, not many go through the whole graduation process. 
and those are not the only people who are successful. There's a lot of people who are making a lot of changes and we don't have any way of measuring that or capturing that um, to show success in the program. So they, they go hand in hand a little bit because maybe the decision is for successful completion, you need three one-year certificates instead of like three consecutive years. Whatever it is that's decided, it could be connected to a benchmark of success like the one-year certificate. That's the only kind of benchmark we have right now. Okay. So I'm just going to throw it out there. Is there anyone who's interested in working on the cost issue as part of a working group? I am. <laughs> <laughs> Having dropped about twenty thousand dollars on the program, <laughs> there you, yeah. you have a financial interest in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if Tracy is interested. Either. I don't know. She popped up on the screen. Yeah, I'm here. I I just don't know the time commitment involved. I I I'm actually going to start a trial shortly so that was my hesitation otherwise I would be interested do you okay do you know? well I think it's going to be a year-long kind of uh or maybe yeah. months long process mm -hmm. so um it's not so much the, the how long it's just like how like how frequently then we would meet and stuff um well if it's only two people we could just email each other <laughs> uh, I'll say yeah, um, as to timing, sorry. No, you're great, you're great, you're great. As, as it relates to if there are potential rule changes, so I think what we'd be looking at is the earliest instance at which we would propose rule changes would likely be November of this year, okay. as far as setting a time frame. Next assuming year, that year. I'm sorry, yes, not yeah. of 2023. Um, as you know, and that'd be I think on the the early side of this, assuming that what we're working in even requires rule changes. I'll just say that too. But I don't uh, think this uh, would. Yeah, for sure. That's fine. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll one. help. I'll assist. OK, thank you. You're welcome. I, I'd be happy to participate uh, in COS or any of the others, really. But I wanted to know first, because I was appointed by this group to be the liaison with the ASAR committee. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how active that's going to be or if that's premature now, uh, if it's kind of put on hold forever or what. Um. I, I think I can answer that. Um, I don't think that there'll be any need in the near future. We may want to uh, convene some folks um, maybe mid-year or so. So I don't think that there'll be a lot to do. All right. So let me express again my enthusiasm and, and desire to be a part of that. I think okay. I'd love to talk with you more about it. Yeah. So I'll join you in the cost evaluation if you wish. Okay. My thoughts. Yeah, it's only have two, I thought, because then it's we have to notice we'll it. We'll verify we? that with OGC, but I, I have the three of you is very interested in this, and we can confirm with OGC to make sure because of the small nature of this committee that three okay. would be okay. And if for okay. some reason there isn't, I will reach out to you after this sounds, meeting, but we can check. Sounds that. good. Okay. Thank you. Um, Leah, Leah Wilson has her hand up. Jennifer. Hi. I just wanted to, one, I, I really appreciate being able to listen to the conversation, and two, just to say that um, with respect to the review, the criteria for successful completion and create the new benchmarks, I would just ask you all to consider a bit broader of a charge or, or an additional charge of um, developing uh, metrics for the program itself. Like, what is it that we want to measure and why? Um, this has been, you know, we currently are collecting some metrics for the program on the monitoring side. We report out uh, some statistical information. I'm not sure that what we're choosing to report out on is the most meaningful or relevant based on the overall sort of goal or purpose of the program. So I'd like to suggest that be added or augmented. Um, and I think, again, it relates probably most to uh, bullet point three. To tackle two and three, that so, would be two and three are kind yeah, of combined. That, yes. Well, that's what I Michelle think they was can saying. be. I, I think, think they can be. Yes. I was going to say, I think it would be hard to. Yes. Yeah, yeah. along, <laughs> exactly. along with what Leah yeah. just said. So, yeah, yeah it, I think what Leah is saying is like bullet three, just make it broader than benchmarks to measure yeah. 
yeah. program effectiveness in general and not just successful participation. I can volunteer for that as well. Great. Okay. So, Heather and Elise. Great. Did Martin join back? No. No, he he did not. I don't. It didn't sound like he was going to come back. Okay. okay. Did you want to talk policy operations and manual? Just I don't know if we want to delve into that. That might. That seems like a second step after all this. It yeah, might I think that it, it might be. <laughs> yeah, because this is going to go into the <laughs> operation yeah. manual. What we'll what have is, to redo that. Yeah, yeah. once we different visions that's happening. Actually, since you're back, Melanie, we were talking a lot about successful completion and then like the, like one question I raised is whether we even need like the term successful completion or graduate, what kind of purpose it serves for like on the probation side. Um, and so I was just wondering if there was any insight. Because yeah. if the court is requiring people to successfully complete lab, do we need to keep something that is called successful completion um, for their sake? Or I suppose um, we need to communicate with them that we're rethinking that. Yeah. I mean, I think it really only comes up in the context of ADP. That's where yeah. I see the successful language being used. Um, otherwise, when people are ordered into LAP, it's usually just to participate. Um, yeah. Okay. So you think if, if this group determines something different about successful completion or not to have successful completion, call it something else or do something else, the court would be open to. Yeah. I mean, I think we need to, that, I think we need to involve them in some way with it because they, and maybe it's just having a discussion with them, but I think we all need to get on the same page about that's the challenge that we've been having is we're not on the same page. Um, so, I mean, I think it's going to be informative for the group to have some recommendations about what that looks like, and then we can have a conversation with them. Yes, that was one thing I, I didn't mention actually is that several of these ideas started crystallizing more after I had a meeting with the judges several weeks ago, um, a couple months ago, probably. Um, and their primary concerns were, their primary concern was cost. And then that relates to the length of time people are participating in the program. So, um, so that's why these have also been prioritized because that's, you know, the energy that's out there now is left is really expensive and how do we prevent that expense from being a barrier to people participating? Well, I think that goes back to what Melanie was saying to the ARSAs or whatever. ASAR. ASAR's, ASAR's point is that um, if you're going to redefine how the probation unit works and that they'll make recommendations to the judges, then it seems like when we define what successful completion is, then we can let the judges know that, and the probation unit know that this is the, this is how LAP defines it. And if you want to have someone do the successful completion, then this is how it's defined. And we'll use the term successful completion instead of saying like that they participate for three years or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I think once it's defined here, it's a lot easier mm -hmm. to translate it mm -hmm. to someone else. <laughs> Melanie, what, yeah. we talked a little bit about, uh, Heather raised the good question of why don't the judges just, you know, recommend that they have to participate in lab for six months or put it, put a time frame to it. And we talked about how the judges in state bar court don't have that type of information typically to make that type of an right. educated right. Uh, recommendation in their orders. So they do it before they, they, they enter it. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. So we have two working groups um, for our two big issues. On the monitoring side. On the monitoring side. So that's what I was going to ask is do we have other monitoring things to talk about? You want to um, I switched. actually flagged something about admission criteria. I don't know if it's, we need to relook at whether it's still consistent, but I think in practice, we're not turning people away because we don't think we can. And 
right. and um, enroll them. So it sounds more like like an academic issue rather than a right. practical one. Well, it I think it is worth talking about, but I don't know that it is worth talking about it yeah. soon. Yeah, yeah. Okay. these are far more important issues. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. Did anyone else during the overview or review mark anything that they thought as part of the monitoring lab they want to bring up, discuss, revisit? I think when you were talking about admissions criteria, that kind of goes to benchmarks too. Mm -hmm. And so, like, you know, maybe we won't talk to specifically about admissions criteria, but like, what does it mean to be successful in the program? And then it gives you more clarity about able to substantially benefit kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. While I'm thinking about it, I can't remember if the current policy manual was included with like, it was not everything. No. If, at some point, could you send that out? Because I think that would be really helpful. At yeah, least for another one. Yeah, really for helpful. sure. That's, well, it probably wasn't sent out because I don't know that it would be helpful at this point. <laughs> 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 because it needs it needs some work, and it says on the policy manual, you know, that this is all slated to change because it hasn't been updated for quite some time. Yeah, but, but it might be helpful to provide it because they they might have input. Yeah, so like how we can change it in a better way. Uh -huh. yeah. And if you could also provide um, anything that's sort of like benchmark related. So any kind of like evaluations or assessments so that we can see what people are actually being assessed on or what they're actually like, the, like we have the report, but I don't know, like what is the clinician thinking when she's determining whether somebody is like compliant and being successful? Yes, well, and the quarterly report, like you saw right. in the monitoring plan in part B, um, number one is this quarterly report that people do and so that can be used also as a measure. And in case we were talking about it, I have the quarterly report questions, what we talk about on it. But that is another tool that can be used where people are responding four times a year to different areas of accountability in their life, structure, support, and law practice management if they're practicing. When we consider the cost <clears throat> recommendations. I think we need to know the budget. Uh, values and what's available and where our money goes and where it's possible to go yeah so we need to know that and then also if you have like a clinical say of the clinical review meetings i don't know if there are areas or like a structure for those meetings that would be really helpful yeah there's well the policy and operation manual has like yes yeah, description perfect uh, yeah So no more suggestions for monitoring. Okay. I think those are two those are, no, they're, great they're, and would, will really help us move the ball, I think, on this and um, plenty to plenty to tackle for the year. So we can staff can help once you know we can reach out to talk about subcommittees, how that will work and set up, you know, follow-up meetings or yeah, you know, interim like, meetings. As we go on, as we virtually meet probably just provide updates from each right yeah. yes exactly are you guys going to set up the initial meeting or should we okay yeah we'll take okay. care yeah we'll we'll get everything kind of started we'll get you materials we can you okay. know work with you guys to schedule dates we can take care of all of that okay mm -hmm. um can we take a bio break before yeah 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 <laughs> we're, we're about to we're about to it sounds like we're about, we're about to, switch switch. to switch. Yeah, so yeah. So yeah. this is a good time to you want to come back at, for and... people on zoom you want to come back at two give everyone just two yeah. minutes since it's, we're coming back late when it was five. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yes, thank you for speaking. Up. How'd it go? Okay. Also, it gives me time to watch these penalty kicks. Mm -hmm.
Okay, we have resumed recording. Okay, welcome back everyone um, who's joining us. Uh, we have just finished items D1 and D3. So we'll move to items D2 and D4, which are support services. Yeah, support lab. Before Erica starts, yeah. Leah yeah. wanted to let me wanted to let all you know that she had to leave, but she appreciated just listening into the conversation and she's looking forward to hearing what materialized about these little small groups. So just Great. wanted to thank you. And I'll give the brief preface of this will be much shorter and in much less detail than what monitoring was, because as we've talked about, monitoring is very well established in what they're doing. Um, there's a lot more detail involved in that. So this is going to be a little bit more high level. Um, but we thought would be helpful is to talk through kind of the current numbers, because we know from the last meeting that everyone wanted to kind of know numbers on things. So we'll talk through participant numbers in support. We'll talk through um, Lita's. Uh, numbers as far as the outreach that she's been able to do in the past few years, as well as a little bit more detail on 2022. And then we'll talk about some um, of the recent changes that may impact some of the support work that we can talk about. And then um, just like we did with the monitoring side, um, to the extent that anyone wants to volunteer to assist in working on some of these issues, and that could be, we would love that. So, okay, if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide, Jennifer. So this is by the numbers uh, at the bottom, and it's, I apologize that it's a little bit small on the screen, but that's um, broken down by TAS and support. And this is from 2019. So support under how this is defined, and Michelle may have to try and chime in here, is the support as it related, it, it's changed in this time frame to a certain extent what support means, like in 2019, what it meant versus now. So we've taken those same numbers, but I don't think it's ident exactly identical services, but. Again, this predates me, so I don't know, Michelle, if there's any differences here. These were the, um, yeah, so the TAS is the Individual Career Counseling, and that's, sorry if I'm repeating some of this, but I'm trying to yeah, no, hear, my, hear my phone. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's the two free career counseling sessions and the two free individual counseling sessions, and those are what really exploded during the pandemic. It's It's brief. And it's free, and especially the one focused on career counseling is just is unique and really excellent um, for people to. It's not a job search service, but it's for people to talk about um, what they want to do if they want to work in a field. If they don't want to practice law, but they have a law degree. What else can you do with a law degree? How can you expand your practice? What kind of things can you move into if you don't like the type of law that you're practicing? So, um, so it's career development. And then um, the support part is the people, right, because we didn't have a whole separate program, but these are the people who came in to the lab who did not want monitoring. So when I had referenced at the beginning that there were people who came in, they meet with the CRC, they get some recommendations, but then we don't follow to make sure that they're doing the recommendations because we're not monitoring them. That's those people. So the people who 